Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. To Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Well, well, well. Hello, kitties. What's cracking? It's Fade to Black. Bespoke. Radio for the masses. Today's Monday, May 9th. 129 days. Or I'm going to say Monday. Tuesday, May 10th. I did it again. Time warp. 129 days into the new year. 200 and. 33 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. I'd like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black. <laughs> You know what? I just got a I just got a call from somebody, so we're we're gonna put him on hold, and I'm gonna break this out to you in a few minutes. But when when this man calls the show, <laughs> I'm gonna pick up every time. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the Planet, I am your oh so humble host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? Got a great show tonight. A great week on the show, actually. Wow. Tonight, we have with us The Real John Lear, part two. Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe is back with us. She's got a lot of stuff that she's working on and researching, so we will go through all of that. Don't forget the call-in number is 323-825-5045. Man, load of calls last night. They were all great. And I do want to thank uh, Bruce Gagnon last night for coming in, uh, you know, on on such short notice, you know, him flying back from the Ukraine and, and then getting so deathly ill, but coming in here like a champion. The show must go on. And then, of course, Thursday night is Fader Night with John Rappaport. He's back with his No More Fake Newsroom. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Everything is Fade to Black. J Church Radio, you know what to do. Just follow, like, and subscribe. Go and get it done. You can email throughout the show, and I'll get to as many as I can. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Of course, in the sandbox with Twitter is hashtag F2B. We don't bite. Come and hang out with us. Every show, we do three, four, five thousand tweets per show. And if you want to check that out and see what that is really like, come over and just hang out for one show. The conversations are great. The people are great. It's amazing. Also, all of our chat rooms are fully packed and active. So go do it. The Spreaker chat room, again, it is full of great people. And it, it is just a great, vibrant conversation. And I will jump in to uh, the chat rooms and, and Twitter throughout the show. You know, I do what I can here. Tonight, we have John Lear with us. I am going to be fully engaged with John. It may be one of those nights where I don't even tweet once. You know, it could be like that. It's funny. When I say three, four, five thousand tweets, it really does happen, you know. But but I tweet 
you know, two or three times before the show, I get in, you know, you know, kind of warm up the crowd a little bit. And then you guys are off to the races. It's amazing. And it is so humbling to just watch TweetDeck and Twitter, you know, just catch fire every single show. So go do it. Ah, now, tonight, always remember, support yourself, support the show, support our sponsors. That's the way that it works. Okay? This is America. That's how it works. It's advertising. Life Change Tea, one of the best products out there, one of the best companies out there. Oh, by the way, oh, you can go to, uh, uh, just go to Jimmy Church Radio, click on the banner right there. Use the promo code Jimmy, get free shipping on your order. Now, I just want to let you know that yesterday, and today I confirmed it, I was doing the liquid, the, dro uh, the drops of Moringa, right, which I've been taking in pill form. And uh, I, that stuff is like the tastiest stuff ever. And you can only do three eyedroppers a day. I did last night. I did I, right over. I did three back to back. I was like, man, that stuff is good. I don't know what moringa is. You know, I don't. I, I don't want to know where it comes from. But that is some tasty stuff. Go check it out right now. Life Change Tea. Get the tea dot com. Also, Studio Dome surround sound speakers and the new TWS True Wireless Stereo Technology. Bluetooth technology that is out right now. You can get that package in a hard shell case, $129. Use the promo code JCRTWS. All the information is over on the website. It's got a normal list price of $399, and you get free shipping. It's the best deal anywhere, anywhere on planet Earth. And it's a hi-fi, true wireless stereo system. It's insane. Get yours today. That is a special fade or not special. Want to remind everybody of all of the events that we have planned throughout the summer, um, and uh, which is contact in the, in the desert in a couple of weeks. In Joshua Tree, California. Yes, we'll be broadcasting live. Uh, I'll be uh, hosting a panel. I think I'm going to be on a panel. I and mean, we have the George Nori birthday party. You're going to want to be there for that. So we've got a full weekend of stuff there. It's going to be amazing. Tomorrow night, we have Linda Moulton Howe on the show. She is going to be a contact in the desert, too, as well. So, and 40 other speakers with Graham Hancock, Robert Bavall, Giorgio is going to be there, Wilcock, Von Daniken, Nori, of course, Jim Mars, David Hatcher Childress is coming in, Danny Sheehan. Ah, yeah, Danny's going to be there. Linda Moulton Howe, 40 other speakers, contact in the desert. Then the Roswell Festival. June 30th through July 3rd in Roswell, New Mexico. Yes, we will be broadcasting live that Friday night. Come and hang out with all of us. It's going to be great. Man, they got a parade. And I want some of you fader knots to go with me out to the crash site. Talking about it, it's one thing. Doing it is another. Let's go do this together. Then the Awareness Life Expo up at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Sacramento, California. August 13th and 14th, and all of the information, go over to jimmychurchradio.com. My appearances are there on the right-hand side. Go and click on it. The links are there. Hotel ticket information is there. Now, we also have, uh, we have about a half a dozen right now. We've got to figure out what we're going to do. But we, uh, So I'm going to let everybody know over in Europe, we've got about a half a dozen or so uh, uh, invites to go over to Europe. So... It looks like uh, we've buttoned down a couple of them, and we will be uh, going over to Europe here um, uh, very, very soon. More on this as it develops and once we lock everything down, but we've accepted two invitations so far. And I think we can make it all happen. It's going to be crazy, but I can't wait to get over to London. And it uh, looks like we're going to uh, Oslo, too, as well. That's going to be really cool. Stonehenge is in our future. Let's get this show cracking because I've got somebody on hold here. Today, Bono is 56. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he's 56. I think he's older. Donovan today is 70. Is that the dude that did Mellow Yellow? Right? Al, uh, let's see. Where am I? Uh, our dead guy's birthday today is Sid Vicious. 1957 and 1979 died at the age of 21. There's nothing more to say than that. He was the bass guitarist of the Sex Pistols. He was more punk than punk ever was. He changed the world. 
and never got a chance to see it. On this day in history in 1877, President Rutherford B. Hayes has the White House first telephone installed. Yeah. And the president or anyone else at that time didn't get any phone calls. In fact, the Treasury Department possessed the only other phone line to the White House at that time. 1877. It doesn't seem like, but I guess they did. They had phones in 1877. Fader fact. The script for the movie Back to the Future was rejected by over 40 times by every major studio in Hollywood and by some more than once. And that kind of reminds me of uh, what happened with Van Halen. If, if you recall, Van Halen was literally rejected by every uh, 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 record company here in L.A. And they kept going back, saying no, saying no, saying no. All of those A&R guys that turned down Van Halen are still unemployed. All right. I want to go to the phones because waiting is the one and only. Mr. Lee Spiegel. Lee Spiegel, what's cracking, brother? Well, Mr. Church, how are you tonight? I, I am doing good, Lee. And it's funny that you called. Oh, yeah? Why? It's, it's real funny because... I was reading a piece of yours on the Huffington Post. Okay. And it was called Ex-NASA Astronaut Tom Jones Used to Be a Big UFO Fan, Not Now. Right? Right. And he's not the singer either. No, the not, the, not the singer. You know, um, uh, and, you know, Albert Finney's birthday was yesterday. And you remember his big break in the movie business was the movie Tom Jones. Oh, yes. That's correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. Tom Jones, for the last 24 hours... Yeah. Has been in burned into my frontal lobes. Okay, <laughs> so so back to you, my friend, uh, which which caused me to call you today, and yeah. hence you calling me back because there was another article. Now, look what I, what I want to try to avoid, and I, I want you to explain what happened. Okay. But let's avoid me getting sued. Okay? And me too. <laughs> oh, right. So this is this is your commentary, not mine. But nonetheless. Um, so I go to the Express, right? That that schlag rag over in the UK, which which by the way, uh, before I get into this, anytime anybody sends me uh, news, right, which I get all day long from the fans and everything, and it's got the Express tied to it, delete, right? I don't even, <laughs> I I I really honestly, and it could be the craziest, coolest breaking most intrepid reporter hardcore journalism ever done in the history of man but i'll never know you know <laughs> i'm serious yeah. I, I i don't want to read stuff from the express so then i i i i, I read an article over the, uh, the express dated today or i'm sorry may 9th right from this guy john austin and uh and the headline is astronaut breaks 20 year silence over space shuttle ufo mystery with conclusive proof yeah and i read the article okay and something smells funky here <laughs> when okay so as i want you to explain when let me go back to yours yours was published on the 7th on saturday yeah. on saturday and this schmo john anderson or John Austin, I'm sorry. For John Anderson of Yes, I'm sorry. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to cloud your good name. Uh, was published yesterday. Yes. <clears throat> now, what's going on here? It, it looks to me. Uh, this is my question. The quotes. It, is he implying that he interviewed? The, he wants people to think that he interviewed this this astronaut. Well, when I first saw this story in the you know in the express and saw the headline astronaut breaks 20 year silence ufo mystery with conclusive proof my first thought was oh is this like another astronaut i haven't heard about and maybe i should look into this right <laughs> all right oh you were and scared started, you I were scared yeah yeah you were scared before you clicked on it when you read that headline i know i mean you must have been fuming but go ahead well, I wasn't sure. I, you never know with these stories. And it was on so close on the heels of my story that came out on Saturday. So I started reading about it. And when I hear words like conclusive proof to solve a famous 
UFO mystery. I thought, well, fine. And I started scrolling down just a little bit. And what I run right into the face of uh, astronaut Tom Jones, who was in my story from Saturday. And I went, well, wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? And according to the copy in the story, it says that Tom Jones uh, can solve once and for all the mystery of something called the UFO tether incident of 1996. And I thought to myself, oh, well, gee, Tom Jones didn't mention that to me when I interviewed him 10 days ago for my story. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was maybe he was holding back on me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, waiting for the Express to call him to give them the real story. Right. Um, and 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 I thought, well, let me let me read on. And then it, it turns out that this UFO tether story, which involved one of the space shuttle uh, flights and supposedly something that had been attached to the space shuttle broke away, this long tether-like thing, and, and I've seen videos of it, that the, the, the claim is that many UFOs started swarming around this thing, um, you know, like moths drawn to a flame. Yeah, we've and, all seen the video, right, right. Yeah. And and it was I think it was eventually explained away as as either either ice crystals, um, but it, but it was very small particles and it wasn't UFOs. Okay, so according to this story, um, Tom Jones, the astronaut, he actually does say that there were ice crystals that could explain what happened, and now we've conclusively found the proof. But I kept thinking, no, wait a minute, that's not at all what Tom Jones and I spoke about. Um, and and then I found that the first quote in the Express story was an actual quote from Tom Jones in a column that he writes for the Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine, in which he said, astronauts have not seen any evidence of alien life. Blah, blah, blah. Usually turns out to be ice crystals or drifting orbital debris, lightning flashes or meteors streaking through the dark atmosphere below. Fine. I, I acknowledge that, yes, this was a quote from his article that he wrote. But then all the other quotes from this story were quotes from my interview that I did with Tom Jones 10 days ago. And Huffington Post was never mentioned. There was no link given to my story. My name was not mentioned as the source. And the story implies that uh, the Express got these quotes somehow, either by direct interview, or that perhaps this was also from Tom Jones's article that he wrote. It never indicates where the quotes actually came from. And when I was putting my quotes together for my story, there were a couple of times where, you know, sometimes when you want to clarify something in a sentence, you will sometimes add an extra word and you put it into brackets so the readers know that you're adding something that wasn't in the original quote, but you're doing it to clarify it. So I did that a couple of times. And, and wouldn't you know it, the exact quotes appeared in this express story with the little corrections that I had made with the brackets. And I'm thinking, how would, how could they get away with this? How could they know that, that I didn't do this thing with the brackets and the clarification? Well, they didn't know, or they did know, but they didn't care. They, they put this story out there and basically have said, uh, this is our story and we're putting it out there. And it, you know, th there's nothing worse in the field of journalism than lifting or borrowing someone else's material um, from a journalistic colleague and not acknowledging where you got your information right or, or where you got your information from. But, but the thing was, I sent my version of the story and the express version of the story to Tom Jones, the astronaut. And I said, what do you think of this? If you compare the two stories and he was upset. Yeah. You know, it's, it's journalism 101. You know, you always give credit and that's it. You know, if it's not yours, you give credit. And, and, and that is what you are taught. That's it. And, and you don't, if you're going to do something like that and put your byline at the top right. and take credit for everything, Man, you better you better be able to back it up. That's all. And and I, I mean, I I couldn't believe it when I read the two stories uh, side by side, 
and uh, it's uh, it's flagrant. So, well, well and, uh, and you know, the other thing, Jimmy, is not only do you acknowledge where you got your quote from in the original story, but you, you you don't take it another step further and fabricate something about the story that never was true in the first place. That's right. The fact that Tom Jones is now giving us conclusive proof of what happened with this UFO tether. Are you kidding me? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you can't make that crap up. You're not allowed to if you're a journalist. Uh, well, we, we, we all know about the integrity of Lee Spiegel. And, I, you know, <laughs> and, and again, just thank you for this. And I, I, I just don't. It, it, it is just one of those another examples of the Internet on what to trust and what not to trust. But I learned my lesson with, you know, that website a while ago. And this just just leaves a bad taste in my mouth because we're all in this together, you know, and and our integrity is is what needs to remain in place. And when stuff like this happens, it just allows everybody else to go. You know what? It, it, it's 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 all just crap. And, and this is also the reason why media gets gets a raw deal and always gets criticized because you know who the losers are in this? It's the audience. Yep, it's the readers. It, it's the readers. It's your listeners. Uh, it's the people who look to people like you and me to give them really good, interesting, credible information. And if they read something that's been fabricated somewhere else, they don't know the difference. They don't know what's true or not, what's reliable. And that's a big problem with all of this. Lee, I want, I want to thank you for coming on. And thank you, uh, we, we've thank got you. other stuff that you and I are working on and, and you'll be on with us very soon in the near future. But again, I want to thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Jimmy. Lee Spiegel, everybody. And again, don't even go and check it out and verify. This is some don't don't give them any clicks. It is just uh, unbelievable. Uh, thank you, Lee. And of course, weird news, Lee Spiegel, Huffington Post. Go and get your read on. I want to uh, jump forward really quick before we run out of time today. NASA made a, a, an historic announcement about 1,200 new planets that could now hold life and the chance of alien life being found. Now, the new number is 2,325 planets, okay? They discovered 1,284 new planets. And the gist of it, and I'm going to cut to the chase, is that NASA is now saying that they believe every star in space it has a planet orbiting it, every star in space, further increasing the chance of life out there. And it is an extraordinary uh, report and story that was released today. And then over on Facebook, about 21 hours ago, this post happened over in the Fader Not family. I believe that's where it was. And the post read, okay, this freaked me out a bit. Watching the TV and a recruitment ad came on. And dad is talking about his daughter joining up. And in the background is a newspaper frame saying that aliens were defeated. At the end of it, the ad said, join the ESD, the Earth Space Defense. I was like, you know, what the blank? And it came across as an uh, actual recruitment ad. Now, this is, let's let's go to this. The link is official. It's www.goarmy.com. Join ESD, right? That's where it is. And you go there, and it takes you through four missions. This is Go Army. This is the official website. And you go through these four missions. One is called Bio Extract. You isolate alien microbes for ED defense operation. Your second mission is Code Break. Decode encrypted alien transmission to, uh, transmissions to expose enemy warfare strategy. Your third mission is called Spacecraft Overhaul. Install alien technology in a hybrid moon tug vehicle. Your fourth mission is Aerial Recon. Avoid alien fighter ships and pilot your UAV back to safety. And at the end of each mission, you get uh, a trailer or a piece of video from the new Independence Day movie. This is on the Go Army website. It's crazy. And then when you complete your missions, you're given a rank. Ours was Sergeant First Class. Yes, we did the missions, right? We did. And our rank was Sergeant First Class. 
with a U.S. Army career selection of microbiologist 71A, and then another link that takes you back to the U.S. Army website. It's like the craziest thing ever. Now, what is the real message here? Think about what is being done. I, I don't understand. I, I, was there money that was put back into an Independence Day uh, from, from the Department of Defense? Was it that? Is there a trade-off? Did Independence Day and Roland Emmerich use uh, the United States Army's uh, troops and trucks and tanks and stuff in, in a trade for this promotion? Or are they really looking for people to go and fight aliens? It's pretty bizarre. You have to go check it out for yourself. Again, it's goarmy.com forward slash join ESD. Now, I don't know. Do we have it up? Yeah, Rita just tweeted it out. It's right here. And if you look, I'm tweeting it now. If you look, there it is. Congratulations. You have now been promoted to the ESD rank of Sergeant First Class. And if you see down at the bottom, microbiologist 71A, entry, right, rank, blah, blah, blah. And then if you see right there, learn more, and it takes you straight to the United States Army's recruitment webpage. What the hell, man? The video clips of uh, Independence Day that they show are actually pretty cool. But this is something funny. And I can't quite put my finger on it. I think you know where I'm going. Now, really quick, before I bring in uh, John Lear, uh, the breaking news, and it's, it's nuts. After skipping work yesterday, Sharon Osbourne returned to CBS, you know, the talk today, to address the reports that she and her husband Ozzy have split up, appearing with her cohorts, including Julie Chen, she confirmed that she threw Ozzy out of after living for 30 years together in their house. She also noted that Ozzy had since moved back in, and she has now moved out of their home. She's quoted on the air today as saying, he's back and I'm out of the house. Asked why she had chosen to split with Ozzy now, she replied, because I'm 63 years old and I can't keep living like this. Strange. And the thing is, we all wondered about that marriage, right? It's a bit it's a bit strange, you know, after all these years. She's so sophisticated and he is who he is. But they managed to stick it out. And that's what's nuts for me. I don't want him to break up, do you? It's kind of, you know, frickin' frack, yin and yang. <laughs> Black and white. They can't break up. Not after all this time. Stick it out. This is Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church, and I come back after this break. The real John Lear is with us. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet, this is Fade to Black. I'll be right back. Listening to Jimmy Church fade to black. Fade to black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three-letter. So, seriously. 
Give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S.com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. Health in America is becoming a top priority. Or maybe I should say, good health in the world is becoming a top priority. Maintaining a healthy body can be challenging. How about letting life change tea help you? Our tea, you make, you drink, and you benefit. Our unique blend of eight different herbs helps you maintain good digestion, a healthy colon, and detoxes harmful toxins and parasites out of your body. And you know what? It tastes great. If you're wanting a change, a life change when it comes to health, health, log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Or you can call us at 928-308-0408. That's 928-308-0408. When you log on to our mobile-friendly website, you can read all the numerous testimonies of how Life Change Tea has helped so many people. We carry many, many beneficial products that help your health and keep you on track. Getthetea.com. Kind of gets in your head, doesn't it? Getthetea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Kletsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the fader knots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass, is Kyle and you're listening, listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, everybody, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your also humble host, Jimmy Church. And tonight we have back with us John Lear for part two. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe is with us. She's got a bunch of stuff that she is breaking as far as the news goes, and we will be doing that tomorrow night. Then, of course, Thursday night's Fader Night with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom. But tonight it's John Lear. He is a retired airline captain and former CIA pilot, as well as the son of the famous inventor of the Learjet. He is a former Lockheed L-1011 captain and is highly regarded in aviation circles. He has flown over 150 aircraft. He has earned every certificate granted by the Federal Aviation Administration. He has also held 18 world speed records and has worked for 28 different aircraft corporations. During the late 1980s and early 1990s, John began coming forward with some startling revelations concerning the subject of aerial phenomena and unidentified flying objects. His website is The Real John Lear, and I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only John Lear. John, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, glad to be here. Yeah. Oh, now, John, do you sound good and fresh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Hey, hey, John, uh, I don't know if you listened to my intro on the show tonight. No big deal. But check this out. Uh, the the U.S. Army. I want to start here because I would love your opinion on this. The U.S. Army on their website has um, uh, four games set up for gamers, you know, video games. And this is the official U.S. Army recruitment page uh, for to test against alien technology to find alien microbes for testing for bioengineering. They have another code breaking thing with alien uh, symbols and you break this code. There's another one where you repair your your craft and you tug it back to the moon Um, and 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 then you get a rank at the end of it. And then. It links you back. It gives you a title and also a suggested career path to go fight aliens. And you go back to the United States Army recruitment page and continue. And when you you may or may not be aware of this, I'm sure it doesn't surprise you. 
But is there something going on where the Army is actively recruiting to uh, uh, confront an impending uh, alien invasion? Is that a question? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I, is there something going on that we don't know about with, with the Army? And do they know of something that is that is coming our way? Well, I'm sure they do, but I don't know if there's anything coming our way. But uh, there's nothing we can do about it, and it's just ridiculous uh, to have that kind of a program like we can do anything about it. Yeah, the, if the, the intelligence would be something we wouldn't know anything about, would we? Right. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to do anything. The, the main problem here is the aliens were the one that made us. They invented us. Uh, they made us in a laboratory, and this is what the government doesn't want us to find out. That's why they come up with all these ridiculous uh, fake aliens that uh, uh, we're going to help them do something, uh, like fix their, uh, I remember 20 or 30 years ago, what it was was um, there, they told us they're on the, or what the military told us is the aliens are on the backside of a, evolutionary curve and then they came to earth to see if we couldn't help them <laughs> but that's so ridiculous i mean those guys made us millions of years ago and uh, there's nothing we're, we can do about it and with um uh with reagan's famous comments you know that he made back at the united nations that we would unite as one you know if if we had to defend the earth against uh an alien force outside of this world i think you know i'm paraphrasing but that's that's what he stated do, do you think that reagan knew something back then too as well i mean why why start the fear if there isn't something there well they tell the they don't tell the president everything when he comes into office of course they all want to know about what's the truth about area 51 they're not going to be told anything uh, about uh, Area 51, uh, and uh, that's all there is to it. When the president gets his briefing, um, the way uh, security clearances work, or 20 years ago they worked like this, um, this top secret is the lowest clearance you can get. Then above that, there's uh, 28 levels of top secret crypto, and then above that there's 10 names uh, of different classifications. Now, each one of those classifications um, has uh, certain information, and, and if you get, say, a classified, uh, uh, you're, you're, you get a classified number of 21, that doesn't mean you get to know everything that's in 21. Uh, they tell you what you need to know. Uh, the President of the United States doesn't get to know very much. He has a, a top secret crypto clearance of about 17. He doesn't need to know that because he's an elected officer. And and one thing the uh, the people that are in control hate is the uh, elected, uh, uh, elected people and appointed people because they aren't vetted uh, through their system. So, uh, you know, there's just no way. That That's an interesting way to look at it because, I mean, for us that don't really understand how that works, because even if the president did go and ask somebody that he thinks is in the know, they can honestly say they don't know anything because they don't know anything. The way it's car uh, compartmentalized, they don't know, right? And and so he he's not asking the right person to begin with. And and he would ask he would have to ask what a thousand different people to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, if he asks somebody what, what's going on, you know, tell me this, this the true story. He says, well, I don't know, but uh, I know somebody who does. Then they go to the, the guy that they think knows something. He says, well, I don't know, but I know somebody that does. And he right. goes on down the line. And all the presidents go through this uh, about two weeks after they're elected. They want to find out the truth, and uh, and they're not going to be told anything. And what they do is they finally get to the end with a guy who, who says um, – no, I don't know, but but I'll uh, try and find out for you. And is that why it's so hard to have a leak? Because the leak would be so small and so fragmented, it, we wouldn't understand what the leak would actually be. There's not big chunks of information sitting in one spot. 
That's that's correct. Uh, a uh, typical example was uh, the guy who uh, has the that owned all the uh, uh, the uh, motels or hotels here in Vegas. I'm trying to think of his name, and he ended up uh, doing uh, the Space Hotel. Do you remember his name? Yeah, Bigelow. Bigelow. Yeah. And uh, Bigelow, uh, when Bob uh, Lazar first came out. Uh, was so interested in it that he wanted to uh, uh, get into it. So he uh, financed Bob. They formed a company that was called, um, let's see, it was called, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, but anyway, he put up some money. Bob bought some computers. They rented a, a uh, office laboratory, and Bob Bigelow thought that, uh, you know, he'd be able to pop in any time and see this scientist, super intelligent scientist working on uh, space projects. But Bob's view of it was he's going to try and use all the equipment there for projects of his own. And he was never in this his office. So uh, they started to uh, uh, get uh, uh, started to um, uh bring this thing to a close and that's when the uh, military uh, stepped in and they said uh, well we'd like to help you and uh, so he said okay well you know I want to find out more about this UFO stuff and the military said well you know we don't know too much about that but we do have several programs where we need a man like yourself who can finance them and uh, we'd like to get you in there. We can give you all the clearances you need. And what they did was gently, gently uh, turn the direction of his uh, of his thoughts to instead of aliens to making more money on the space program, which is what happened. Yeah, that was the end so, of that was the end of uh, Bigelow and his UFO research. Right. Uh, what what you know, John? For the audience, and they would love to know what what drives you. You know, what drives you to continue this pursuit of truth? The fact that uh, so many things are absolute lies, uh, that each each thing that I find out, that's just another lie. It, uh, you know, started out with, I'm trying to remember the, the first big thing that... Uh, uh, that happened. Uh, let's see, TWA 800 wasn't the first thing, but that was certainly a lie. Right. And uh, that was shot down by a, accidentally by a U.S. Navy submarine. And that was the fifth uh, passenger airliner that was shot down by the Navy accidentally. The uh, first one uh, was a uh, Lockheed Constellation in 1963, shot down uh, over Guam in the Pacific. And uh, it was just a training mission, and something happened to the uh, uh, the uh, bomber, the uh, machine gun release that it went off when it wasn't supposed to, and they uh, they killed all. I think there was a hundred or so servicemen that were killed in that, and they've kept it secret ever since then. It's just saying we don't know what happened. But I was with Flying Tigers at the time. Uh, I flew for Bob Prescott, who was the president. And uh, there's all these rumors going around, and I still, let's see, in contact with um, uh, one of the persons who's who's uh, uh, the head of the family. The guy was a soldier, and he was on that airplane, and she's tried to get to the truth of that particular accident. But, uh, no, that was the first big lie. And then uh, along came several others, and then the TWA 800, they had to protect the Navy. So what they did is they con concocted the most ridiculous um, excuse, which was that uh, there was a uh, uh, fuel pump in the center main tank uh, that managed to light the fuel in the center tank uh, and blew the airplane up. That's total BS. There's nothing in the center tank that could ignite anything. Every All the pumps are totally sealed. And it was really interesting because I was uh, flying... Um, Boeing, uh, let's see, 767, 67 or 77 parts, uh, the um, the uh, engine uh, mount or the engine uh, cowlings. Uh, I was flying the L-1011, and that was the only airplane that had a big enough cargo door that they could fit those things in uh, from Boeing and Wichita and take them to Seattle. And it was just at that time when the uh, when the um, 
uh, air, uh, TWA 800 was, was shot down, and you should have heard those guys at Wichita, you know, commenting on the story, saying it is so much BS, there could not possibly be of a, 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 um, a airplane or, or the fuel ignited by a fuel pump. It just doesn't work that way. There's no fuel pumps in there. So anyway, uh, in addition to that, uh, there was another bunch of lies. Maybe you, you remember the um, uh, airplanes that uh, there's two of them that happened, uh, or three of them, that were absolute positively captain suicides the first one was united airlines in uh, colorado springs and uh, the uh, the airplane on short final about uh, 300 feet in the air it just did a half of a roll and plowed right into the ground when they when they got to the tapes what they found out was um, the captain uh, was uh, uh, a, a a friend or a a uh, uh, a friend of the co-pilots actually taking her out. They were going to be married, and the the night before, uh, this uh, woman co-pilot had found out the captain was uh, hanging out with with uh, another girl. So at the beginning of the flight in Denver, it was only about a twenty minute flight. They argued all the way down, and uh, just on short final, uh, the captain says, "Well, if I can't have you, nobody is." And then he reached over and. Uh, did a half roll and uh, killed everybody on board. Now they can't tell the public that, so they have to come up with some phony excuse. And and the excuse was that the yacht amper, uh, uh, the yacht amper uh, failed. What they call it's a hard over, and uh, uh, pushed the rudder all to one side. Well, this excuse doesn't work for anybody who's really knowledgeable about uh, yacht ampers and airplanes, which I am, and the. The, to take over the uh, the rudder, it only requires an 80 pound uh, push, which you can do very easily with your leg. Uh, so they were caught, you know, trying to figure out what they were going to do uh, excuse wise. Then after that, they had the uh, 727 going into I think it was Philadelphia uh, on a three mile final, did the same thing. And that was a suicide too. And he just uh, pull over. And the reason you can figure out what the why it's a suicide is you look at the tapes, um, the flight recorder tapes. There's 156 channels that are recorded uh, the whole time of the flight. And in the one in Philadelphia, you can see the uh, captain just rolled it to the uh, left and uh, it just pushed forward. There was no attempt uh, to roll it back. There was no attempt to pull it up, nothing like that. Uh, but the FAA went along and said, uh, oh, here's another yacht amper failure, failure. So they blamed both the Colorado Springs and the Philadelphia on yacht, uh, on, uh, yacht amper failure. And uh, it was just a ridiculous for people who know what's going on and never going to make that thing uh, uh, sell that to anybody who really knows what's going on. Now in the TWA 800 um, that was a unarmed missile and they act, it, what it did is it accidentally uh, latched on to um, the uh, TWA 800. Actually it was uh, following a drone which is standard practice and they were doing it off the uh, coast of New York and uh, they always do that. They, uh, what the general public doesn't know is these air, uh, civilian, civilian airplanes are used as targets, but they, you know, take every possible precaution to be sure that it doesn't actually uh, go off and and uh, uh, and uh, destroy the airplane, which in this case it did. And what it did is, for some microsecond uh, or millisecond, it uh, lost contact with the drone, and when it reacquired uh, contact, it reacquired the TWA-800, not the drone. And so this unarmed missile went straight to first class uh, out the other side of the airplane, broke it in half, and that's what uh, caused the crash and, and all the uh, fire that everybody saw. And NTSB completely ignored uh, all of the witnesses that saw uh, the uh, fire from the airplane uh, coming out of the sky. Uh, they were told, no, no, you mistake. The the uh, fire was going up as the airplane was uh, being bombed, or, you know, the bomb was going off. <clears throat> and so um, uh, this was a, was another uh, incident of um, 
of uh, claiming the fuel on the center tank uh, was causing these crashes. Why this was important to uh, airlines like I flew in, we were operating on such a s small margin um, of um, of cargo that getting rid of what, what the FAA said was okay, no more center tank fuel, and or it was certain uh, uh, held to a certain level. And for the airplanes and cargo companies that I was working for, if you can't carry that extra load, you're not going to make any money. And and the uh, airline that I worked for went went bankrupt uh, strictly due to the FAA claiming that it was a uh, uh, fuel uh, ignition in the center tank, which it wasn't. But they come off with all these darn excuses that, that, that are really lies, and they just come, keep coming one after another. Uh, we come to 9-11, uh, and people were told that uh, uh, Muslims uh, who flew these airplanes into uh, the World Trade Center. I can't tell you how ridiculous that is, uh, having a guy that has never flown a, a um, 767 get in that thing and uh, fly it and hit the World Trade Center, which is 200 feet, 208 feet wide, and hit it dead center. It's just impossible. <laughs> and uh, I wrote a uh, uh, 11 or 12 page affidavit, which I sent to the uh, New York, um, uh, the New York courts, uh, supporting uh, another uh, another um, uh, suit. Uh, trying to prove uh, that it wasn't what they said it was. And what you have is uh, a crash where there's three million parts between those two um, airliners, to both 767s, and uh, all parts used in an airplane are stamped or marked indelibly uh, or engraved uh, so that anything happens, they can trace and find out what caused it. They just don't go down to uh, AutoZone and, and buy a compass or go down to AutoZone and buy a screw. Right. All this stuff is uh, is carefully vetted. And uh, what happened in the 9-11, there was, out of three million parts, there wasn't one single part ever found uh, to that belonged to either of those 767s. And yet there's still people that believe those airplanes flew into the uh, <clears throat> flew into the World Trade Center. It just did not happen. It could not happen. And then the um, well, let me let me let me ask you this, John. <clears throat> You're the professional. I'm not. Um, I have Microsoft, uh, whatever, right? Uh, the uh, the airplane program. Uh, if 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 somebody went and trained on one of those trainers, like Microsoft or whatever, and 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 took a couple of classes, right, flying a a, a Cessna around or whatever. How how possible is it for somebody to sit in a cockpit, even by chance, to fly into guide the plane? How complicated is that cockpit in a real sense? It's one thing on a flight simulator, and it's another thing in a Cessna. It's a whole other thing in a seven six seven. I realize that. I mean, is it is it even remotely possible that it could somebody could do it? Not even remotely possible. And there's been several experiments uh, with uh, people who are uh, currently flying uh, the 767 or were then uh, 20 years ago when this happened. Uh, and they have taken either themselves or um, or reporters and taken them up and said, okay, now here, here's the airplane. We're at 8,000 feet. There's the building. Try and hit it. And, of course, they don't even come close. And neither do the captains who are currently flying the airplane right. even come close to took hitting the center of a 208 foot target it's impossible well what i did and this is what's funny confirming what you're saying uh, i uh you know i've got microsoft flight simulator i've got all of them and i went through a whole period in my life where i had the rudders and i had the sticks you know i had all the controls and all i did was crash planes right i could not <laughs> get these things to land it was hard to take off and this was after months and months of of trying to master it it is it's completely difficult it's not something that i think anybody can do and then when you jump into the real world that's a whole nother thing i just don't see how it's possible but if they didn't crash into to the world trade centers who did it was a hologram and how is that done the hologram is uh 
was a uh, technology that it was developed about 30 years ago, and what it does is it projects, uh, projects an image in the sky without a screen or anything to project it against, and use it uh, to uh, say or use it to project an airliner or whatever in the sky uh, flying along, and that's what. Uh, all the people saw was, was a hologram. And they say, oh, no, I was standing there, I saw the real thing. But it's not possible. And the people that uh, say that aren't familiar with the technology or how far ahead we are in uh, in technology of that sort. Now, Japan is coming along with it, um, uh, with, with the holograph. But remember, the Air Forces or the... Uh, uh, the military has had a 30-year uh, head start on this, and they were able to uh, project this stuff. And, of course, nobody heard, really heard any sound of it. And then they had bombs already in the uh, in the uh, World, Tra- World Trade Center ready to go off when uh, uh, it was supposed to, when, when the uh, airplanes allegedly hit there. Um, uh, in the Pentagon, where it hit the Pentagon, uh, my daughter sent me a tape the other day of the reporter that was reporting there, and he's the one that said there's absolutely no uh, it, no uh, visual damage or n- no evidence that an airplane flew through the Pentagon. He says, I saw a small hole there uh, where the fire was coming out, and I saw two pieces of wreckage on the lawn, but nothing like <laughs> a big airplane, 757, flying into the Pentagon. And then you have the lady who uh, was desk was 40 feet from the ho- uh, from the hole there, and she was right there when the bomb went off. And uh, she just happened to have her six-month-old son in his car seat uh, below her desk uh, when all when all the fire went off and the smoke and everything cleared. She grabbed him and and stepped through the hole that the bomb made. And she says, I didn't smell any fuel, no jet A, no uh, no fuel, no nothing and didn't see any parts, no airplane parts. There was nothing like that uh, going on there. And the Army has really given her a bad time for the last how many years it's been uh, to keep her mouth shut. And uh, she's had a a real problem with that. But, you know, so many people um, believe this, this this, uh, ridiculous story. And then the one at Shanksville, uh, was supposed to be an airplane that uh, they actually made a movie out of, and the airplane crashed. There's no airplane crash. Uh, what happens is uh, with a large airplane like that, um, there's an ACARS system. The ACARS is a unit in the cockpit that records everything that's going on in the airplane and sends it immediately to the company in Boeing or whoever made the airplane so they can keep track of what's going on. And uh, the ACARS, uh, unfortunately for those who concocted this uh, this ridiculous 9-11 uh, thing, is uh, the ACARS kept going for four hours after it was supposedly crashed. But, you know, that information doesn't get out to the public because they're, we're, we're, we're trying to sell them that the Muslims uh, did this and, and they're terrorists and we got to go after them. And the whole thing about 9-11, the reason that happened was because uh, our military, as we were uh, um, as we were uh, warned by President Eisenhower when he retired, he said, beware of the military complex. Well, what they've done is they've used trillions of dollars uh, to make airplanes and bombs and all kinds of stuff like that, and there's no enemy. We've been friends with the Russians ever since the end of World War II, and the reason we were friends with them is we had a bigger enemy, which was the ETs, the aliens. Uh, and so what well, was decided let, let, was that uh, let me, uh, we John, have... John, let me jump in right there. We're at a net hard network break. So let me take that right now. We'll pick it up right there with the Russians and the ETs right after this short break. Our guest tonight, John Lear, the real John Lear. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. More with John right after this short break. You can follow us on Twitter at Radio. Hashtag F2B. Jump in on the real-time conversation. I'll be right back. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. 
and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Kajimi, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. What would your life be like if you woke up each morning with new vitality, feeling better than you have in years, and you noticed the difference in your sleeping patterns, blood sugar levels, and had a sense of well-being overall? There's something that is changing thousands of people's lives, and you could be one of them. It's called Heart and Body Extract. Sharon Harris, co-creator of Heart and Body Extract, talks about the positive effects of this product. What happens with the formula Heart and Body Extract is it's giving the body the necessary vitamins, minerals, amino acids, enzymes, and phytonutrients so the body will heal itself. And yes, the body does have the ability to balance blood pressure, balance cholesterol, clean and unclog the arteries. It can also work on balancing the circulation for diabetics. So the body is an amazing thing. It simply needs some help so it has the tools to heal itself. To order your two-month supply, call now toll-free 866-295-5305. Order online at hbextract.com. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're of the Honey Brothers. <laughs> we are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, the planet. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, very special guest, John Lear, back for part two. Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe is with us. The call-in number is 325, or 323-825-5045. And, of course, Thursday night is Fader Night, open lines. And John Rappaport with his No More Fake Newsroom. Now, John, right before the break, we were talking about... Uh, the Russians and us and uh, the common uh, the common factor between the two being E.T. And, you know, that we don't today really have a common enemy. Uh, certainly uh, terrorism is is what the new Cold War is. What did you mean by that? Well, we manufactured the terrorism, and the way we did it is uh, in uh, 1947, after the end of uh, World War II, um, we uh, 
made a deal. We had started to know about the uh, the ETs. I mean, way before that, the first one we covered in the United States, I think, was in Missouri uh, in the uh, early. 40s, but it wasn't Roswell. Roswell was the one that uh, kicked it off and let the public know uh, what was going on. Uh, but it was decided between the Russians and us that we would fake a Cold War uh, so that we could get the uh, general public to worry about atomic bombs coming over from Russia instead of the ETs, which the which the uh, uh, which the government was really really worried about. So um, this uh, Cold War went on and on and on and worried about these when they weren't the the enemy or the, these uh, supposed enemies. So uh, that went on uh, and way past the uh, you know the 60s, 70s, 80s. Here we are, 80s, and uh, we're just starting to. Uh, uh, there's so many things that we do with the Russians. Everybody, you know, nobody says, well, wait a minute, I thought we were enemies. And uh, uh, we're not. We uh, we did so many programs with them. Um, we agreed to, in the uh, early 60, uh, 60s, uh, that the, the Russians would uh, send a uh, uh, an orbiter to uh, Venus, and then we would do the moon thing. And it was all uh, uh, planned between them to uh, pull off this uh, uh, this uh, hoax uh, of the uh, hoax on the public. And these things just go on and on. And it's really interesting uh, to learn if you know some of the facts how they go on. For instance, Malaysian 370. Um, that airplane uh, took off from Kuala Lumpur and uh, was headed for, let's see, I think, uh, not Peking, Beijing, I think, um, and uh, then turned left uh, over the uh, uh, over the uh, the ocean and uh, headed out of radar contact and uh, then disappeared. And there's been, you know, how long has it been that they've been searching for this and all kinds of search. What happened is the airplane was flown to Israel. It was uh, parked in a uh, secret portion of one of the uh, airfields there and modified so that it could be flown by a jet flying alongside, controlling the ailerons, rudders, and throttles. And uh, when uh, the uh, alleged 217 uh, took off. This airplane was flown from Israel uh, with two jets guiding it all the way up. They took over the uh, uh, the flight uh, path of the 217 and uh, were what was the 217. There was really not a 217, but they uh, put this airplane in there. All the passengers had been killed before, and they were dead in the airplane. This airplane flew along until they got to the border of Ukraine. Then it turned left a couple of degrees so that it would uh, um, crash after it was shot down uh, in the in the uh, Zionist controlled portion of Ukraine. Uh, so what happened is uh, when it got to that uh, part of Ukraine, the two uh, fighter jets shot it down, and it crashed, and everything was handled by uh, the Zionist-controlled uh, portion, uh, portion of uh, Ukraine. And people are looking for 370. It's crashed. It's in Ukraine. And, and all the, the bodies and everything, everybody's starting to figure that out, that that airplane crashed uh, in Ukraine. There is no other other airplane. Why is it, John, that the, the simple question is, why isn't there GPS on every single plane, private, commercial, on planet Earth? I mean, we all have GPS with our cell phones. It's that simple. Why, it, why could something that fundamental just not happen on, on aircraft? Why don't they do it? They do. There is GPS on uh all of the uh, major airplanes because the manufacturers of the airplane and the manufacturers of the engines want to uh, uh, be careful of liability about what their airplanes are doing so they got to know where it is at all times uh, there's I'm, I'm not sure I think it was Rolls-Royce with the engines on that particular That's right. uh, 767 That's right. uh -huh. um, but um, uh, those those things were operational. So Rolls Royce, Boeing, uh, all know exactly where that airplane is, where it landed, whether it crashed or or uh, uh, whether it made a smooth landing, and all that 
information is held together by uh, the people that uh, would be liable if something else happened, if it were really hijacked. Um, and uh, but they know what's going on. But the forces in in control and whoever those might be may be uh, make sure that that particular part of the information uh, doesn't come around. Now, for the people who follow the 9-11 story in the Pentagon crash, you had uh, um, Cheney, Vice President Cheney, uh, up there in command of the uh, uh, of the operation, and I think it was Mineta there, or somebody saying, uh, no, it wasn't Mineta, it was, I think Mineta was the guy that heard the conversation, and the conversation was, the airplane's 30 miles out, uh, did the order still stay in? And Cheney says, yeah, have you heard anything different? And so Cheney knew exactly where that airplane was going to go, exactly what it was going to do, and it was actually a uh, flyover. What they did is that they flew at about 200 feet until they were uh, parallel with the um, uh, with the entrance or with the wall of the Pentagon that they wanted to hit, and then they had the explosion, the bombs that went off uh, in the Pentagon, and that airplane flew along uh, out of sight, probably landed there at Andrews Air Force Base or some other place uh, near there. And uh, there's nothing, you know, nobody was killed in that airplane. Where all the passengers went, I don't know. Are they still alive? I don't know. Uh, but they, whoever's in control of all this doesn't seem to have uh, too much sympathy for all the families that uh, are uh, related to all the people that are killed. For instance, uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the every god it's really tough getting these words out uh, it's like somebody's trying to stop me <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, the world trade center number one and number two uh is um you know was where they were going to hit and there were, there was no no uh, all this was just uh, a plan using holog holography uh, which the public doesn't know any about, and if so if they don't know anything about it, they're not going to uh, know that it was just a hoax. With um, uh, with MH370, uh, certainly Rolls Royce and the telemetry and the world uh, real time communication that they're supposed to be getting on all of their aircraft through the leasing agreements that they have with airlines, we know that they're following all of these aircraft and then they Absolutely. want to, yeah and they want to turn around we're smarter than that but they really want us to think that they have no clue as to where that aircraft ended up that we just lost sight of it when you have australia with all of their radar that is on that coast right you have yeah. you know indonesia and vietnam and uh, all of the other countries that are there that are that are military establishments but nobody knows anything it just doesn't make any sense but yet that's what no. they want us to buy Okay, so what happens is we're trying to figure out why all of this is going on, and it's going on because our military, as we were warned by uh, President Eisenhower, beware the military-industrial complex, they built all these new airplanes, the F-22 and the F-35 and uh, newer, better bombs and everything, uh, but if we're friends with the Russians, who are we going to pick on? Well, uh, geez, we're running out of, we're running out of enemies, we're going to have to make enemies ourselves. And uh, so we started manufacturing the terrorist threat. And uh, between uh, Gulf War One and Gulf War II, uh, our carriers and battleships were in the Persian Gulf and uh, bombing uh, uh, Iraq uh, just indiscriminately there to create enemies so that these uh, people that lived there and the sons and the children, when they grew up, they, all they knew is that the, bomb, the Americans were bombing that place and they were now became the enemy. And uh, so that's the reason uh, was we need somebody to fight or we're not going to get any money uh, from Congress to build new and better weapons. Let's. Uh, you, you made a comment earlier about the Soviets going to Venus and us going to the moon. With the Apollo program, uh, is, is, was that a hoax? Did we, the original Apollo program that we know of, 11, 12, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, did we go to the moon with that program? 
No, absolutely not. We didn't go any more than 300 miles out, and the reason was is because of the Van Allen belt. And Van Allen was the the guy that was in charge of the three uh, rockets that measured in, uh, let's see, 58 and 59, 1958, 1959, measured uh, the radioactive uh, signature, how much there was, and uh, he said it's impossible. We'll never get through that. We, we need five feet of lead to protect the astronauts. But everybody forgot about that, and then when it came up to questioned, uh, we find uh, Van Allen saying, oh yeah, I made a mistake. Uh, it seems as though I made a mistake and that uh, it's really no problem. We can just fly through that. And NASA had so many stupid uh, excuses, like one of the excuses, oh, the Van Allen belt, well, we just flew around it. <laughs> what does that mean? You can steer a rocket? <laughs> <laughs> it's just completely stupid. Right. But the bottom line is, most of those programs didn't go anywhere. Mercury, Gemini, uh, Apollo, Apollo never went to the moon, even close to the moon. And the reason was is because of the Van Allen belt. And uh, the other thing they don't want to find out, the uh, the population of the moon is a quarter of a billion people, humans just like us, but not from Earth. They're from somewhere else, and I don't know where that somewhere else is. But uh, there's plenty of breathable air up there. We've been sold that uh, the gravitational pull of the moon is... Uh, one sixth that of Earth. That's a complete lie. And what happened is uh, in 1993, a lady named Perry Spalter, S P O L T E R, write that down and buy the book. It's called uh, The Gravitational Force of the Sun, or gra yeah, Gravitational Force of the Sun. And she proves absolutely, mathematically, and scientifically that the um, that Newton's Isaac Newton's uh, uh, second law of uh, gravity is wrong, absolutely wrong. He said that uh, gravity is uh, created by the size and the density of a planet uh, or object, and that's totally wrong. Uh, when he died, somebody put in a false equation, and that equation was uh, gravity equals uh, mass one times mass two over r squared, radius squared, and that is the thing that brings you up uh, falsely uh, to that the, the moon's gravity is one sixth that of Earth. If you use a different and uh, different equation which doesn't use the size or the uh, density of an object, then you find out that the uh, uh, gravitational pull of the moon uh, is 68% uh, that of Earth's. That means that Apollo could have never gone because they'd have never had enough fuel uh, to go. Like Von Braun told us at the beginning of the space program, uh, we're going to need so much fuel that the rocket has to be taller than the Empire State Building. But everybody seemed to forget that when uh, all this hoopla about Apollo going to the moon. That's why they had to murder Virgil Grissom. Virgil Grissom was the guy that was uh, always complaining about uh, uh, the uh, Apollo program, and he's well, the one that would say, this thing ain't going to the moon in two years, this thing ain't going to the moon in, in ten years. And uh, so they put him uh, with his crew in the Apollo 1 and rigged it to, uh, to catch on fire. The problem that they had was there was always an extra fourth crew member uh, on those test flights, and the uh, the fourth crew member was always uh, a guy named Shea, and he was the head of the Apollo program, and he was always there uh, inside, and yes, there's plenty of room for a fourth crew member. He just lays with his feet in the cargo, and uh, the rest of his shorts, his, his uh, chest and everything, laying on the uh, center instrument panel. And uh, <clears throat> so... What happened is uh, when it caught fire, and I'd sure like to hear the tape because Virgil Grissom really let him have it because he knew he was going to get killed at some some point or another. And uh, so uh, when they had to recover it, there's always been an unexplained 45 minutes lapse of time uh, after the fire before they started removing Virgil, uh, Chaffee, and White. The reason there's a lapse of time there is because that gave the secret NSA crew time to get in there and move 
remove the secret astronaut. What happened is Shea had to go to New York that day, and he couldn't sit in there, which he usually did, and they used a, a, a astronaut from the secret astronaut corps. Well, the problem is, now that he's get dead, if anybody finds out that there's a fourth crew member in there, they're going to want to know, well, where did he come from? What's his name, and how come he's in that thing, and he's not on the list of any astronauts? He was in the uh, secret astronaut corps. So I have this guy's name, and uh, someday, hopefully, uh, if when I'm still alive, I'll find somebody who knows that name. I've never said it, never told anybody it, so I know if somebody comes up to me and said, John, was it so-and-so, I'll know whether he knows the, the, the real story about Apollo 1 or not. Is that why when we look at the uh, the video of the astronauts on the moon, if the original, uh, what they're telling us about the gravity, it seems to me with the weight of the, the spacesuits and stuff, that those guys would be jumping off of their tippy toes 10 feet in the air, but they're not. Absolutely, absolutely. Would be going way high with one sixth the gravity, but uh, those guys were barely hopping, you know, 10 to 12 inches. There. Right. Uh, yeah, I've, I've noticed that too. It just seems like that they should be up there just ding, you know, boinging. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the right technical term. But it, yeah, and, well, and they're you know, not. We laugh about it, but it's a very serious matter. We have uh, Neil Armstrong, I think, who passed away recently. And, you know, he never allowed any picture of him uh, on the moon. There was no picture of him on the moon. Uh, there was only one. And that was taken by the uh, camera on the strut of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Apollo lander. And uh, that was the only picture that was there. But he's never given. Do you know how many interviews he's given since he got back from the moon? Like you tell me. Two. <laughs> One. None. Yeah. None. Right, right, right. Zero. Yeah. Zero interviews. And that means something uh, that he didn't want to be a part of his hoax, that uh, he realized he was in it too deep to get out without getting killed. So he just kept his mouth shut. Well, you know what it was like back in the 60s, the rah, rah, rah team behind the space program, right? And, Absolutely. And, and so when you are coming back from setting foot on the moon, do you think you can crack a smile? Do you think you <laughs> Right? You know what I mean? Well, that, not only that, when they got out of the helicopter after being eight days on their back, when they, they came down the steps, it looked like they were, you know, just finished working out at the gym. They just hopped down those steps, doop de doop de doop doop walked 50 feet across the uh, deck of the uh, aircraft carrier and got into the uh, Airstream uh, trailer. And uh, it's not like they had been on their back for uh, eight days. Yeah, and and I remember watching, uh, and I've gone back and done it as an adult. But that that original press conference where they came out, right, Buzz and and Neil and and who was the uh, the the commander, uh, the capsule uh, uh, number three, uh, number three, young, I think. I, I, no, uh, I was. Um... Uh, I'll think of it in a second. Okay, we'll we'll get back to uh, third guy, but they came out. And what looked like they were bummed, and <laughs> and I, you know what I mean. And I would have thought yeah. that they would, you know, just be high fiving each other and bro hugs. And you guys just got back from the moon, and it looked to me like they could not wait for that press conference to end. They couldn't right. wait and to then get the, And then the English guy threw him the comment or threw him the question: Did they see stars? Well, why wouldn't they be able to see stars? You know. And then they say, well. No, we didn't see him. Uh, the fact is, they didn't see him because they weren't on the moon. And when he turns to he turns to Neil Armstrong and he goes, "You know what? Uh, I don't remember seeing any stars. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> weren't you guys just on oh, the moon? God, this is something else. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, the Apollo Eleven crew. I'm going to look this up really quick. I can't remember the third guy, and I should be shot, you know, because uh, Michael Collins. That's who it was. No. Yeah, I'm looking at it right here. Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz. Oh, Collins, Collins. Collins that's what's that. Yeah, Collins. yeah. And uh, you're right. And and the whole hype behind the space program and all of his kids and 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 America, we were just so happy, and they they weren't as happy as us. And it should have been the opposite. They should have been glowing, and yeah. and and they just weren't. I'm, I'm not saying that's confirmation of anything, but it sure, certainly would be suspicious if I was a juror. 
right? And I'm watching, uh, if I was a juror, you know, on a yeah. jury, and I'm watching that activity like that from somebody on the witness stand, I go suspect. You know, I think yeah. something yeah. strange. Somebody's not telling me the truth. Yeah. Now, uh, I want to stay on the moon just a little bit. With um, uh, us not being, you know, the, the radiation, I understand that. The other complex thing for me is the technology. When you think about what we had then versus what we have now, I don't know how they would have made it to the moon. That's that's a little bit uh, crazy for me to think about. But the other part of it is we haven't been back and we have right. not gone past that three, four hundred mile orbit uh, here and yet we have all of this amazing technology unless we're doing it and we're just not telling the public no and we lost all the um, the film and we lost all the records and uh, they wanted to build the uh, uh, the uh, what was the name of the rocket it was a fake rocket but uh, uh, recently when somebody suggested we go back to the moon they said oh we've lost those uh, plans for the rocket we'll, we'll have to see if we can find them how could they lose the plans? Well, it, um, and and if you remember, uh, you just brought up a good point about the tapes of the original Apollo missions. They yeah. they recorded over them. What do you yeah. mean you <laughs> recorded over the tapes? Well, who does that? And I'm I'm just sorry. You can't be pinching pennies that much that they just needed to reuse audio and computer tape. Yeah, no, they uh, they just have to uh, figure out a lie, and uh, one of their front men, uh, James Ober, goes right along with it. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we went there, we went there, and uh, it's just all an outright lie. Now, what is uh, – uh, we're going to be headed to a break in about two minutes. Um, today, what do you think is going on out at Area 51? Did Have they moved it? Do you think that there's nothing going on there? Could it be up at Dugway or maybe at some island in the South Pacific? Or is the actual real research in alien technology still cranking out at Area 51? They're still working up there. Their big story was – uh, that they were going to move it because they didn't want hordes of people uh, with buses at the uh, uh, on the perimeter there to uh, to interrupt uh, or see what they're doing. But uh, yes, it's still there. They uh, came up with this story that you know, there's a secret base out of Dugway, uh, the actual secret base, and there's more of them. The only one I know about that's really secret was built at the same time uh, Groom Lake was, and that's uh, up. 40 miles south of Wendover, Utah, just across the border into Nevada. And there's no name for anything where it is, but I have friends that have been there, and uh, that's where the black triangles fly out of and other stuff. But Area 51, yeah, there's still a lot of stuff that goes on there. I think that, uh, you know, I know of 15 levels uh, below the... Uh, uh, the desert floor, and uh, supposedly there's another 30 levels beyond that below there. What they do there, I don't know, but yes, it's very, very active, and uh, it's getting so much that they're they, uh, getting the people up there. Uh, you know, they had a um, um, uh, they had these five airplanes that uh, bailed, or what what they call rented from Hill Air Force Base, the Air Force unit there, taking the uh, taking all the people that work there every day. They go back and forth, but now they have so many people up there that what they did is they built a secret subway, and it goes from uh, Luxor right across from McCarran Operations, where the uh, McCarran uh, uh, Operations for Special Operations is, and. Uh, it makes a stop at uh, Bellagio, and then it goes straight into Groom Lake or Sandia. The, there's a new secret base. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, there's another secret base called Sandia, and that takes up most of the Paiute Mesa there. And uh, out on the desert floor, there's two gigantic runways with a uh, hangars in between them. And what that was able to do was the people were able to uh, work on different projects and go out the other side of the hangar and fly without the people on the other side knowing what they're doing they were trying to you know uh, increase the secrecy I, and uh, i have uh, a great i have a great idea for the both of us let's you and i go to the luxor what do you say <laughs> let's yeah i, I want to i would the, uh, the, the original door was in the uh, uh the gift shop we'll be right back with john lear this is fade to black i'm your host Jimmy church stay right there
Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Do you know what's in your body soap? Well, I didn't know the answer until about five years ago when I looked at the label of my soap and was shocked to see all the chemicals. For my entire life, I had been assaulting the largest organ of my body, my skin, and to think my children were using it too. Well, a lot has changed since then. Today, my family and I operate Stone City Farms, where we make and sell all natural goat milk soap using fresh goat milk from goats we raise on our farm. Our mission at Stone City Farm is to produce high quality, all natural goat milk soap for people who want a fresh, unrefined natural product. At Stone City Farms, we offer scented and unscented soaps and a signature line of gift sets customizable to your needs. To see what our customers are saying, go to StoneCityFarm.com. Use the code NATURAL for a 20% discount. That's StoneCityFarm.com. Code NATURAL for 20% off your order. You never know what could be hiding in your soap. Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, a deep right center. That goes Lewis to the wall, and it's all here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Back to Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, John Lear is with us. Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe, right here on Fade to Black. Thursday night, Fader night, John Rappaport will be here and his no more fake newsroom. Hey, John, I got to tell you, the uh, the questions that have lined up here in Twitter, uh, oh, man, I'm going to try to get some of them, if not all of them, in tonight. But uh, people love you, man. I just uh, I just got to say, and let me um, uh, before we continue, I just have to. This is from Mark, and he says, can you ask John about his near death experience when he crashed as a young man in 1962? Yeah, uh, when I crashed, what they did is it was uh, near the uh, it was in the soccer field at the boarding school I used to go to and the ambulance drive to Geneva, Switzerland where the hospital was in about 45 minutes. And uh, I uh, I didn't remember the crash, but on the way to the hospital, I remember floating above my body and looking down and saying, no, I'm hurt too bad. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to make it to the hospital. And then about five years later, I was in a um, uh, an airliner on approach to Geneva, and the outer marker is right near this boarding school. And as we flew over it, I'm looking down uh, about the height that I started this original spin from, and I had a total recall 
of hitting the panel. I remember the the shoulder straps breaking and my head going forward into the panel, and that that was the two things I remembered. Wow! Did you uh, did you do all of the uh, the things? Did you see the light at the end of the tunnel? And no, no. Uh, your life, your life. Did it replay in panoramic seventy millimeter Panavision? No, that'll come in a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if not sooner after this radio program. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John. Um, now, uh, the secret space program, this is what I find interesting. And uh, last week you had mentioned uh, to us uh, very briefly, I, I want to go back to a couple of your comments. One of the things that you said last week was uh, that – there are mirrors out there deflecting what we really should see. How how does that work, and and how do these mirrors work? Uh, just like regular mirrors, and the the ETs don't want us to know uh, in our uh, in our star system, which includes uh, our sun and the nine planets that uh, NASA tells us about. But actually, there's a, four, a total of 40 planets, and uh, 39 of them are hidden with gigantic mirrors. You have no idea how uh, capable these people are of, of building stuff, and they have robots that build this stuff for them. And, uh, yeah, that uh, just like a regular mirror, and it's pointed at a different direction so that the uh, reflection of the planet uh, is somewhere else that we can't see. So we would be looking at space then reflecting in the mirror. We would just see blackness. Right, just see black. And now what about uh, the, the, the dark side of the moon? You've talked about this a lot, and I'm fascinated with this because there's a lot of reports that have been coming out now more and more about what is going on on the dark side of the moon. And, uh, you know, now China wants to fly on the dark side and take pictures. And I find that a little bit strange that finally that would happen. And the other part of that is why haven't we flown to the dark side of the moon and, and flashback pictures? They just haven't done that. What's going on on, on on the back side of the moon? Well, we have pictures and I have a bunch of pictures and it's not the dark side. It's the far side and it's lit just as, as much as the side we see. Uh, and then uh, when the uh, Earth re revolves, uh, the uh, then the far side gets just as much light as we do on the sea on the near side. For instance, uh, it's a full moon tonight, uh, or I think it was a couple of days ago, it was a total full moon. And uh, <clears throat> there's plenty of action on the near side as far as buildings and uh, structures and bridges and uh, there's a, I've got a great picture of a jet port on the far side, and uh, it's just as clear as can be. Uh, it has the jetways and the uh, walkways, uh, and it has the control tower uh, and everything. And it's, uh, uh, yeah, we we took a lot of those pictures on the far side of the moon uh, with the explorers or the um, what was the name of that. Uh, there was a mission that went uh, between 1965 and 1967. Uh, there was five missions uh, with cameras, and what they were doing was trying to find the the best uh, landing place for the alleged Apollo. Mm -hmm. And those are printed. I just happened, you know, just by accident, about 30 years ago, I was in Portland, Oregon, and there's a huge bookstore there. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but I was walking in it one day, and I found a section just on NASA that had old NASA um, printings, books. And uh, I just bought all of them that were there. And uh, not knowing what I need them for, and now... Uh, they're tremendously value because they have pictures of the uh, far side that are printed pretty clearly. And enlarging those, uh, you can find all kinds of stuff there. With, um, uh, I, 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 I kind of want to get this thought out correctly. With the, when you say the far side of the moon, and is it lit up like it would be uh, when... When Earth is dark, when it's nighttime, is it like that? When it's dark, you know, uh, and nighttime on Earth, no, you it can lights up. Lights up for uh, half of the thirty days that it uh, revolves around the Earth. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I understand. But what I'm what I'm saying is when Earth is in night, we can still walk outside and see. You know, it's not totally black, right? Is that yeah? What you it, can see you can see the moon, and particularly on tonight, you can see it totally lit. And in about uh, 15 days, uh, it'll be totally dark. And uh, you can usually see the moon uh, when it's dark. You just can't take any really good pictures. Yeah. And so um, on the far side of the moon, is it the same as our nighttime, like midnight here? Is that what it's like on the far side of the moon? You can still see there's still plenty of light? Yeah, Yeah. Uh, except the sunsets are uh, three days long. And uh, the the uh, the daytime color of the sky is saffron yellow, and uh, I found that out from Howard Menger, uh, who's passed away about three or four years ago. But he was taken to the moon by the people that live up there, and um, he spent about uh, a week there. And uh, they took him to all kinds of different places, showed him all their stuff that they got going. It's really interesting. And he was still alive when I started my really uh, uh, interest in the moon. And so I uh, emailed him uh, and asked him uh, if I sent him uh, six color swatches of saffron yellow, would he pick out the one that was closest uh, to the color of the sky uh, daytime on the moon? And I sent these uh, swatches, and he sent back, and he put an X in the one that was identical to the uh, sky that he saw when he was there. And so when you say saffron, that kind of saffron, orangey, yellow, saffron color? Yeah. Yeah, that's and, uh, So then I... I have some pictures of the moon, and what we did is we put the identical color there in the sky. So you got a, 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 what it would look like if you were in the daytime moon, uh, if, if what, what you would see in the sky. Who, who, who has been? I know you've you've had your your inside people. I'm putting quotation marks around inside. Uh, you, can you talk about that? Who 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 you've been turning to for information over the years, and especially yeah, if nobody. they're not, if they're not with us anymore, you could go ahead and say it. Yeah, no, nobody uh, that I've got any information from that, that's not available to everybody else. Who the problem with using as something somebody for information is they might be you know bogus. So you've got to find uh, stuff that uh, you found on your uh, by yourself uh, without any help. And and then okay, so then if that is and and I understand that, then who would you go to to vet the information? Now you've got to go to the next level and confirm what you found out. Who who do you turn to for that? Uh, nobody. I have nobody to turn to if I say the moon is. Uh, Daytime sky is saffron yellow. That comes from Howard Menger, who was there on the moon. And uh, you'd have to ask me a specific item where I learned that information uh, and who gave it to me. Right. No, I understand. I was just hoping you would tell me, Jimmy, man, I've had this one guy for years. <laughs> and now I'm going to just, I'm going to no, lay I've it read, out. I've read every Apollo book uh everything that's available on Apollo and uh, I pretty well know the story backwards and forwards and and who got killed here and and uh, all the the different accents and and stuff like that there's a bunch of good books now the day before yesterday BBC came out with a video that really chops NASA at the knees I mean they come out with so much information that the uh, Apollo with the hoax it would do everybody good. Just go to uh, your favorite uh, browser, whatever it is, and uh, type in um, uh, BBC uh, Moon Video. BBC or fake moon. fake yeah BBC and then uh, fake Apollo program. Okay. It just came out a couple of days ago, and I watched the whole thing. I think it's an hour, an hour and a half. And it's pretty good. It's what everybody else came up with. There's three books that come out with the same information. They're coming all to the same uh, the same point was Apollo was absolutely a hoax. There was no truth to that program at all. Neither was there to Mercury or Gemini. Very few of those flights ever really went. You, you know, I'll tell you something really funny. Uh, years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, um, 
I have, uh, th- there's a big uh, Russian community here in Burbank, as you know, right? And coming up to me, because they know I'm into this stuff, going, you know, uh, uh, Apollo was a hoax. You know, we, and, and, and over there in the Soviet Union, they've known about this for a long time. And it wasn't propaganda. You know, this is, and it's really funny where I would try to defend and listening to my Russian friends, bang, 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 bang out facts. This is not coming from Bart Seibrel or, or other people that have been doing this uh, over here for a long time. This is yeah. from a whole nother community, a whole nother country, a whole nother continent that, uh, you know, they've known this for a long time. And it's really funny. And, 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 you know, for me, John, it's not, yeah, we have the Van Allen belt. We, you know, we, we have those issues and, 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 and what Von Braun said about the size of the rocket and fuel. like it. You know what? When I went to the Smithsonian and I looked at the Apollo capsule and I took a really yeah. hard look at it, that looks like the technology from a 1960 Volkswagen Beetle. That's what, that's what that looks like to me, man. That doesn't look like anything that made it to the moon and back. It just right. It and just, the lunar lander is the same thing. There's scotch tape all over it, and uh, this is while they were in flight, or you know, when they were uh, able to take some pictures of that, and uh, when they uh, allegedly moved away from the uh, orbiter, moon orbiter, to land on the moon, allegedly land on the moon. They took pictures, and and the the, the use of um, Masking tape and uh, duct tape and all the rest of that—that that is just ridiculous. And the uh, the 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 uh, thickness of the uh, wall of the lunar lander, I think, is is like uh, a thousandth of an inch or something more ridiculous than that. And that was supposed to hold in uh, four or five pounds of pressure for them to believe, but uh, uh, to breathe, but. Uh, you know, it just it's just ridiculous to look at some of those pictures. Yeah, and survive the uh, the crazy uh, temperature swings that you have. You know, it's hundreds of degrees going in both directions, and and also all the micro meteorites that would be flying around. You know, it, it just seems to me like it would be pinged full of holes, and it would never have had pressure to begin with. But yet yeah. they expect us to believe that. Um, I wanted to uh, I want to shift gears and and pick your brain a little bit on MJ twelve and those documents. You've been outspoken about this for a long time, so let's let's clear the air on 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 some of it. Uh, MJ twelve, the collection as a whole, those documents, hoax or real? No, real, and uh, they may be modified a little bit. But uh, when it first came out with. When uh, Bill Moore first came out, and I got my first copy of it, uh, the first thing I did was uh, figure out how to get to Jimmy Doolittle. Now, Jimmy Doodle, Doolittle was uh, one of our famous generals. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called uh, I Could Never Be So Lucky, and doesn't say anything about this in it, uh, but really a great guy. And when I had my airplane accident in 1961, he wrote me a two-page letter of how uh, not to be discouraged by that, but just to profit by your mistakes. And I've got that framed on the wall with the picture of him taking off the aircraft carrier in the B-25 uh, going to uh, bomb Japan. But anyway, the plan was to get him to comment. So I went to my mom, who now, to go back uh, 50, 60 years, um, I lived at 222 14th Street in Santa Monica. And Jimmy uh, Doolittle and his wife, Jo, lived on 3rd Street. And they used to be over at the house all the time. Uh, so we knew them pretty well. I didn't, but my folks did. So um, after uh, Joe died, uh, Jimmy moved to um, Carmel, and my mom kept in touch with him like every month or so. Hi, Jimmy, what's going on? Uh, and I was up in Reno, and I said, Mom, this is really important to me. I want to sometime when you're talking to Jimmy, just say, look, uh, Jimmy, John's getting involved in something. I'm not sure whether he should or not, but uh, I want to know if MJ-12 is true. And uh, he said, yes, Moy, it is, but I can't tell you anything more about it. So that for me was, okay, now it's full speed ahead. And, you know, Jimmy, we're talking about Jimmy Doodle, not only a hero uh, and a general, but if anybody was going to be in the know about something like that, I would I would say Doodle would be the guy. Absolutely. And he wasn't an MJ-12er himself, but he was just as close as you could get. 
Okay, so what about the original list of the MJ-12 and and who was there? You feel good about that? Yeah, that was good. I'd just like to know all the details of uh, Forrestal, who allegedly committed suicide with a rope tied around his feet, jumping out of the 22nd story of uh, Walter Reed Hospital. Um, they killed him mainly because he was so... Um, uh, he wanted to tell the public what was going on, and uh, and they just didn't want any part of that, so they had to kill him. And what what? How did you feel when uh, Bill Moore stepped up at MUFON and said, "You know what? I've been a tool," you know, <laughs> and and ran out the back door? I was uh, that year. I was uh, head of uh, Las Vegas uh, MUFON or Nevada MUFON, and. Uh, when uh, I was uh, supposed to, you know, run the whole uh, show, and so I picked my speakers, uh, who was, uh, let's see, there was uh, me and Cooper and uh, uh, two others, I forget who they were, and we were carrying on uh, in the next room. The reason was is because uh, MUFON, after I picked all these guys and set them up, said, no, uh, we don't want you to have those guys speak. We've got other people we want up there. And uh, so instead of obeying their orders, what I did is just set up the next room there, uh, the, the um, convention room, and had my uh, my own people there uh, so that we could hear the real stories of, of what were going on. And how did you feel at that moment? It was really interesting. I had maps of that. That was the first time that uh, Area 51 had come to the uh, public. Uh, knowledge and uh, there was a guy who used to uh, knock UFOs all the time. His name was Phil Class, <clears throat> and uh, I've known Phil since he was a since I was a little boy. He was the uh, always has been the aviation editor for Aviation Week, and basically he was supposed to uh, uh, discredit all the UFO stories. And uh, uh, I made the badges for. Uh, all the people, all the speakers uh, at the um, convention, MUFON convention, and on his I put Philip Class MJ-12, and he just picked up that badge and wore it and never looked at it, never looked at the MJ-12. <laughs> Everybody thought that was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is hilarious now. Uh, I, wish, I have a picture of that. I wish he was still around because I would love to uh, have him on this show. It would not be fun. It would not be pretty. I mean, you no. know, he was he was a straight shell, you know, uh, on the payroll. And yeah. it, it just he was somebody that and especially when I go back and look at those old uh, interviews and stuff that he would say publicly uh, about about people was just wrong, and especially like what he did with Travis Walton too, as well. I mean, just just uh, uh, no. And Larry morals. Warren, he did the same thing. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, but back to um, back to Bill Moore. So when he made that statement and dashed out the back door because he probably would have been taken out uh, into the streets on Las Vegas Boulevard and tarred and feathered, and so he takes off. What do you think that that did? for the MJ-12 documents at that point? I mean, for you, did it put a question mark on everything? It, and was he just, was he given real documents and and used as a tool? No, he was the um, uh, gopher for uh, Richard Doty. And we already knew those guys were all in the payroll and, and that's what was their job. So um, I didn't pay any attention to that. Have you uh, have you talked to Doty since then? No, I've never talked to Doty. But who I talked to was uh, Robert. Uh, I'm trying to think who he was. And Linda Howe and I met at a UFO conference in Crestone, Colorado, and there was uh, eight of us there. And uh, all we did was kind of assemble all the uh, information that we had. And that's when uh, Tom Adams came to me at the end of the conference and he said, John, I got this note in the mail and I'm not going to be in Las Vegas. Can you, uh, can you uh, check on it? And it was a note from, um, uh, she, many years she made us call her, uh, Mr. X, but her real name is, um, I can't remember her real name, but, um, anyway, she, uh, 
uh, had written this note to Tom Adams and said, I have a friend who worked as a security guard there, and uh, he's written me about the uh, underground uh, facility at Dulce, and I'd like to talk to somebody about it. So this is the first time I ever heard of Dulce or an underground facility or anything like that. And so <clears throat> when I got back to uh, Vegas, uh, I contacted her, and that's when I got really involved in this uh, Dulce thing and, and the fact that it was real. And uh, what happened is when this guy left work at Dulce, he had uh, 25 black and white photos, eight minutes of videotape, and 100 pages of information. And he put uh, six copies of these into separate containers and gave each container to a friend of his, each to six different friends of his, including uh, Sherry. And uh, there was, um, uh, and he said, if I don't, he contacted Sherry every four months. And he said, if I miss two contacts in a row, in other words, eight months, you're free to do with these whatever you wanted. And uh, Sherry had uh, hidden, um, the one package, which is about uh, 50 miles south of Las Vegas in the mountains, she took me down there. I didn't climb up in the mountains to look for it, but uh, she showed me where it was. <clears throat> and um, that was how that came came about. Now, what happened is after that uh, conference in um, Crestone, Colorado, I drove with uh, Linda down to see Clifford Stone in Roswell. And as we left... Uh, uh, Crestone and drove down to, let's see, we go by uh, Española and uh, near uh, Los Alamos. And uh, just after that, there's a big long valley. And this is in 1988. And there was four or five stealth fighters following us the whole way. Now that stealth fighter hadn't been released to the public yet. And uh, it was really interesting to see them. And uh, then we went on down to uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that city. It's before you cross over um, uh, to the main highway going down to Roswell. But halfway, uh, right at the turnoff to where Brazel's Ranch was, uh, we're driving along. I'm with Linda Howe, and we see 14 or 15 dead cows. And I'm wondering, holy smokes, how can this be that I'm with Linda Howe? We just happened to run run into these cows, and we walked over there, took pictures, and uh, looked for any signs of classical um, mutilations, and then there wasn't any. And then we uh, drove down to find the first ranch and asked that uh, rancher what he knew about the cows. And he said, oh, they have this uh, disease, and uh, uh, one of the agencies is going to come down and pick up the cows. What what were the odds of that happening? You and Linda and fourteen dead cattle. <laughs> I mean, oh yeah, that was, that was really weird. There's been things that happened like that, and the the other thing is when I we stayed with Clifford for a couple. I did with a couple of days, and uh, when I drove home, uh, it was dark when I got to um, Kingman, and so. Kingman up to the dam, up to the Boulder Dam, uh, in those days, and that's been, what, 30 years ago, uh, was dark as hell. There wasn't one single light uh, going up to the uh, dam. And I'm driving along, and just a little on edge, thinking of all the stuff I'd learned and everything, and uh, this, I see this little light behind us, and it wasn't a car light, wasn't that big. And I'm colorblind, so I'm just saying it was like orange or red or something like that. And it's following me along, and I got scared. And so I started speeding up until pretty soon in this old truck of mine. I'm doing 90 miles an hour. And then I thought, wait, this is ridiculous. I'm going to uh, stop and see what is. So I slowed down, stopped, got out, looked behind me, nothing, couldn't see any, any light. And then, well, I'm just imagining things. Got in the truck, started it up. And again, going along about 60 or 70, and here's light back again. And uh, after a couple, oh, maybe 30 minutes, it disappeared. And I never know what caused that or, or what they were trying to do, but uh, it certainly scared me. The real John Lear. This is Fade to Black. More with John when we come back after this break. Hey, John, you want to take a couple of phone calls? Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's open up the phone lines. This is Fade to Black, and we have the real John Lear. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the 
Metal Guard on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. If your home has hard water and it's leaving white spots, then it's likely that Limescale is clogging your pipes. Limescale can cost hundreds of dollars a year in wasted energy and early appliance breakdown. HydroCare systems available at Wave Home Solutions prevent and remove Limescale with just a simple filter change every three years. There are no salts, chemicals, or magnetic coils. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, just go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Hi, I'm Richard Dolan. When I'm not hosting my radio program, The Richard Dolan Show on KGRA, or writing new books on UFOs, I run a publishing company. I'm proud to say that Richard Dolan Press has published some of the most fascinating books available on UFOs and related subjects. They include Dr. Bruce Maccabee's classic analysis of the UFO cover-up, David Marler's breakthrough book on triangular UFOs, Dr. Richard Souter's unique work on underground bases, and other classics by Grant Cameron, Chase Kletsky, and Dr. Bob Wood. Not to mention intriguing works by Eve Lorgan and Laurie McDonald that deal with truly bizarre phenomena. I'm proud to publish such high quality and original works, and there are several amazing books about to be released over the next few months. Go to richarddolanpress.com to learn more. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back to Fade to Black. Tonight, our guest is John Lear. Taking your phone calls, 323-825-5045. Follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio. If you have any questions, you want to fire those off in Twitter. Yes, I see them all lined up here, and I will continue to get to those. But that is hashtag F2B. I want to remind everybody, tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe is back with us. And then Thursday night, we have open lines. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. What's your question for John Lear? Okay, I have two questions, and unfortunately, it's not Linda Moulton Howe here. This is Dino. Uh, John, I requested you on the show. We love you on the show. The first question is short. If you believe that the Van Allen radiation belt prevented anybody going up there, how does the secret space program get around that problem? Uh, they have help from the ETs. Okay, so they have some kind of a, a substance or a, a, a shield in their ships. Right. Okay, now the second question is a little more involved, and I'm not wishing any kind of demise for you, but I asked Dr. Mitchell uh, before he died last year. I happened to be at a conference, and by, by phone, the same thing I'm going to ask you. I understand that you have certain top security clearances, correct? I had them. I don't have them anymore. Okay, well, what's connected to that is what I would ask you, because we all so, many of us are so at awe of all the information you have, whether you had a, a place where maybe you have other 
individuals where there are things that you have never revealed publicly to any of us on the UFO circuit or anywhere that perhaps after you're gone, you will release things that you couldn't release while you were in oath, so to speak. No, I released everything that I know. There isn't one thing uh, that I have kept secret that I found out. Okay, there you go. All right. That's, thank you so much. We enjoy hearing you, John. Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dino. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. What's your question for John Lear? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Captain. How are you, Jimmy? I'm doing good, hey, Captain. Doing? Okay. Uh, John? Oh, oh so- sorry about that. that. That was me. Okay. John, I want to say congratulations, sir, because uh, you're one of the... Uh, very, very astute people to uh, interview, and I, I think very highly of you. Thank you. My question is this. What do you know about the Black Knight satellite, and what do you think about it? Uh, what is that? The Black Knight satellite. <clears throat> you know, the Black Knight satellite. That was the one that we... Uh, Discovered in the middle 50s, right? Yep. And it was orbiting, and uh, we were trying to figure out what it was and what we could do about it. And and there's that's about all I know about it. And that's still about all we know about it, John. <laughs> 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 they have they have managed to uh, keep that under wraps. Uh, and it's funny when NASA let those. Uh, uh, images go on their website, you know, a few years ago, and then they pulled them all down. Yeah. Yeah, which is uh, pretty dramatic. All right, Captain, anything else? Uh, yes, uh, I do want to ask uh, John, uh, what does he know about the uh, the galactic that was uh, in the uh, uh, time uh, when they had, uh, I think it was one of the uh, graves they have captured? And uh, this gray lived for quite some time. And uh, what did he know about that? They were living in one of the uh, compounds. Well, and, there's uh, a couple of there's a couple of grays that uh, that we had. When you say captured, it's it's unlikely that you actually captured anything. The grays are robots, very advanced robot robots. They know more than any of us. Uh, and uh, the uh, the the people that are behind all of this cover-up have tried to put out a couple of EBEs that uh, uh, that aren't really EBEs. One is called the J-Rod, and uh, they dressed him up in a regular suit with a tie. Uh, they put him in a uh, uh, a uh, they put him in a uh, Air Force flight suit and put him in an A-10, and they were trying to sell people that uh, this was an EBE, and they're still trying to say that the ETs are here to get help from us for some program. Either, you know, they have something wrong with their uh, uh, system or uh, something that they need help from us. And it's complete, uh, completely asinine because there's no way we could know as much as they do and they wouldn't be having, having us help them uh, at any point. They might be asking directions, you know, <laughs> maybe they're lost. Hey, hey, Captain, th- thank you for the phone call, brother. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. What's your question for John Lear? Hi, um, my question is, last week when you brought up that gentleman that he, I guess he was channeling uh, supposed ETs, and then all of a sudden he figured out that they were not, actual EPs, but it was the military industrial complex messing with them. That's right. Uh, I, I would just like to know exactly like his in-depth analysis of that, or even if he's even been aware of that actually happening last week. Or Okay. You know, that's a great question. What's your name? Uh, Nelson. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you for the phone call. John, what he's asking about is last week, Greg Giles, uh, somebody who has been channeling uh, for years uh, the Galactic Federation, and uh, he came out on his website, on his blog back in January, and said, look, everything that I have been channeling uh, was uh, signals sent to me from the Department of Defense, uh, three-letter agencies, and it was a sophisticated mind control program I wasn't actually channeling. All of my information was coming from 
uh, Washington. And and he apologized to everybody about that, about being a victim of this technology. And that's that's what came out last week. What do you think about that when it comes to channeling and people that are in contact with, you know, E.T. races that this could I've never be... bought into any channeling, never bought into uh, anybody being uh, uh, being uh, given secret information or any information by E.T.'s. And 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 why is it is it because you you know something else that 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 wouldn't be possible or are you just saying that people that are channeling are are bogus? No, I've just never heard a, a legitimate story coming out of a channeler. And do you think right right? Do you think that the channelers believe what they are channeling? Totally. Yeah. And and it could like I said, uh, you know, when Giles came out and said this, it made perfect sense to me. He believed what he was channeling. Yeah, you know, and and you just don't know where this information could be coming from, and it could be very sophisticated. You may believe just you know what I'll give you an example, John. The the holograms or the holographs that of of nine eleven. The people on the yeah. ground are seeing. Oh, an actual object. They believe what they are seeing is real, right? It's Absolutely. The, it's, it's the same thing. Very interesting way to look at it. Um, now, oh, I wanted to hit you with a couple of questions. Uh, the phone lines are back open, 323-825-5045. Um, what's your favorite movie? And I'm going to ask you, I want to ask you this on two different levels. I do this with, with all of my guests on the show. Um, what's your favorite movie we all have one and two what's your favorite movie about et that you think is there for propaganda uh most of them are there for propaganda right uh my favorite movies uh, uh would have to include rocket ship xm oh yeah and uh destination moon uh, destination moon was uh put out by george powell and I forget who put out Rocket Ship XM, but uh, boy, when I was a kid, those were real. I mean, I thought we are really on the moon. <laughs> you know what's funny? I watched uh, Rocket Ship XM about two weeks ago, and uh, <laughs> I know I, I I love to go back to those movies, man. I just I just love yeah. them. And Reed is just like, really, one more time? Do we have to? And I just I I, I can't help myself. Uh, for me too, it's also Forbidden Planet. Uh, that one is just. Uh, is right there for me. So you you think they're all propaganda? Oh yeah, a lot of this stuff is propaganda that includes hostile aliens because there are some pretty hostile aliens out there, and not out there, but right right on Earth. And I have a friend of mine who was uh, in the military, stationed in Okinawa, and uh, he was part of a team that would be sent periodically over to Vietnam uh, when there was a sighting of a um, uh, sighting of a uh, uh, alien. And uh, he said that he saw one and actually one actually touched him, but uh, uh, they didn't go, they didn't capture it like they were supposed to, but they stand, well, actually what they are is actual Mothman. And they stay stand about seven to eight feet tall and have huge wings on the back of them. Uh, the wings don't flap, but somehow they give them lift if they want to go up or sideways or anything uh, like that. And and when and you said that you met with Clifford Stone. He's one of our favorite guests uh, on this show, and and I I have such immense respect for him. But there always seems to be. Uh, uh, a military aspect when it comes to ET, and I'm talking about intervention. I'm talking about flybys, going back to Foo Fighters in World War II, everything that happened in Vietnam and the Korean conflict, uh, and then of course we have uh, the interference that has been run over our nuclear installations around the world, not just here in the United States. Why is that with ET, and what is it that they are concerned about? I don't think they're concerned about anything. They have um, a lot of objectives, an agenda, and I don't know what that is. But uh, basically, and I'll say it again, I've said it a couple of times, but what the government is worried about is that when we find out 
<clears throat> that uh, uh, when we find out that the ETs actually made us, uh, there's nothing uh, that we can do about it. I mean, we're just uh, not so much an experiment because there are billions and trillions of humans that they made all with a different uh, uh, agenda, uh, all with uh, something else that they're trying out. But uh, uh, it's all their work, and uh, that's what the government doesn't want us to find out. Number one is because they can't tax them. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, number two, they have absolutely no control at, over, at all over them. What do you think about Hillary and her talk today? And Obama's been doing it, too, as well as, you know, uh, 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 Bill uh, Clinton has made his rounds and his comments on, on TV about, about E.T. But Hillary today, throughout this election, Seems like that's all she wants to talk about is UFOs, uh, aliens, ETs, and Area 51. What's the agenda there? Is is it something going towards disclosure, or do you think she's just trying to get votes? Just trying to get votes, because uh, if she looks at the history of this, every single um, person that's been elected uh, always goes in and... Uh, and start to trying to find out who has the bottom line uh, on uh, ETs, what's the information. And uh, after about two weeks, they're given uh, some letters and a talk to, and uh, they, they come back with their tail between their legs, and uh, uh, they never ask that question again because they're told that if you keep this up, uh, there's going to be big trouble for you and your family. What is YY2, and what is its significance? YY2 is the mailbox uh, for where the uh, EBEs, or one of them, was kept at Los Alamos. And that was one of the key questions that we told Bob Lazar when he was he thought UFOs and aliens were total BS. He used to tell us, look, I worked at Los Alamos, and I knew everything. There was, uh, there was nothing that I didn't know. And uh, I never heard anything about aliens or UFOs. Uh, the same thing with Ned Day, who was a very, very uh, knowledgeable uh, newspaper writer here in Las Vegas, and I was good friends with him. And uh, one day I was in the studio, uh, Channel 8, I took a whole bunch of stuff uh, that I wanted to release, and I told the whole story to... Ned, and he looked at me, he said, it's not possible, John. And I said, why? He's because I know everything that's going up at Area 51. And uh, that's when George Knapp was walking by. And uh, since uh, Ned Day had blown me off, uh, uh, I was obvious George Knapp came over and said, John, would you mind I, if I look at your stuff? And that's what all started the uh, friendship between me and uh, George Knapp. With he wanted to listen, whereas Ned Day did not. I have to ask you, because I certainly got an immense amount of satisfaction out of this, but going back to Bob uh, Lazar, and when he brought up back in 89, 88, Element 115, right? And then right. now there is an Element 115. And by the way, I think they should call it Lazarium. You know, that, <laughs> that's, that's just me. I think uh, we should get a campaign going on that. But... Uh, what did you think about that when Element 115 was confirmed? Did you just step back and go, holy crap, I did believe him, but now I really believe him? No, I confirmed it with Bob. Uh, one day we, uh, you know, we originally had three pieces of uh, 115. They were shaped, arrowhead shaped, about two inches long. And uh, what we did is uh, we wanted to confirm the attractive uh, um, ability of this element. So we got some dry ice and a bell jar, and we put the um, uh, the 115 uh, over the dry ice, and uh, the dry ice was supposed to make fog when the bell jar was on it. And then we got a, uh, a portion of the Coleman lantern, uh, which uh, puts out a, a radiation um, that you can get nowhere else. Uh, and it goes uh, out of the uh, uh, the element into you know outer space at millions of miles an hour. Uh, and what we wanted to see if it really did uh, attract uh, uh, if 
years, it really did uh, attract uh, the element. And yes, it did. It filled up with fog. And uh, uh, I think there was one or two cases where uh, these things came zinging out and made a U-turn uh, into the 115. And that was pretty much... Uh, pretty much satisfied everybody that was around there, which was me and George Knapp and Bob, and uh, on, on the reality of it. As far as them making it now, uh, they could only make an infinitesimally small portion uh, after months and months and months of, uh, uh, of trying. They, they, you know, it's nothing that they could make that would be of any use. Right, right. It just lasts for... Nothing, right? It just comes and goes. Hi, let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. What's your question for John Lear? Hi, this is Eric. Hey, Eric. How are you doing? Hey, John, I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you still stay in contact with Bob Lazar? Yeah, he has uh, United Nuclear uh, in uh, Michigan, and he sells um, scientific equipment to universities and, uh, and, and schools all around the world. I want to ask you, I, I read an article recently where you, apparently you, you get a lot of information that you, so you, you spend a lot of time uh, researching and reading it. Are there any news stories that are out right now that you're interested in uh, maybe talking about? Uh, any news stories? No, I can't think Kyle of Odom. <laughs> oh, Kyle Which Odom? One? Kyle Odom, have you heard his story yet? No. Okay. Um, anything else, Eric? I'll, I'll tell That's John. It, buddy. Was curious. Okay, you got it. I'll tell him about Kyle Odom here in just a okay, second. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Guys you have so- a good night. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, did you see Bob uh, last year when he came through Vegas and went to the museum and uh, did the interview with Knapp? Yeah, he did the uh, one of the interviews in my in my den. Oh, he did. It looked yeah. familiar. The the one at the table. Yeah. Okay. So that was at your place. How, Bob uh, looks like he's he's dabbling with the fountain of youth. He still looks pretty good, doesn't he? Yep. Sure does. I mean, his mind is right there. There's um. There. I, I'm going to tell you about uh, Kyle Odom in a second because uh, that's something you should go and research and check out. It's a pretty fascinating story. There's okay. one, my one comment about Bob, and I have said this to anybody that wants to debunk. Or, or go after him. There's there, there's one thing, is that I have watched every interview, I've watched every presentation, and of which there's a lot out there. You were there for most of it. And I have tried to get him to make a mistake, right? Just, <laughs> and I'm, I'm being serious, John. And, Nothing and, ever changes in his story. Yeah. I, I, not only that, um, there's that part of it, but... It's uh, done with uh, somebody that is speaking the truth. I'm looking for the little elements there that that tell me that somebody is being untruthful or dishonest. And right, I right. can't see it. I can't find it. And that's why I, I go with Bob. I go with Bob on this. And, the, and then there's the other part. With the uh, oh, you know, with the 1010 agreement, right? 10 years in prison, $10,000 fine. Yeah. With him coming forward, uh, then one would say, well, then how come he didn't go to prison, man? Well, you know what? If they send him to prison, that means he's telling the truth. Right. They, <laughs> they can't. They can't. They can't find him. They can't say anything. All they can do is just let him talk. Because if they do anything else, then they've got some explaining to do. Right. Exactly. Now, I'll tell you about Kyle Odom. Kyle Odom is the guy that uh, last month was arrested throwing objects over the White House fence. And so the Secret Service goes and arrests him. And what he was throwing over the White House fence were USB drives, right? And he tells the Secret Service, and he had a manifesto that he had written before his arrest, that yeah. he was a, a victim of a, an alien cult in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and, uh, and his pastor was a reptilian. There was a shape-shifting sex cult of Martians that, that had taken over the earth. And this and, and and but this is this is what's crazy about the Kyle Odom story is that he uh, 
uh, uh, up until two years ago, till 2014, he was a, a, a college graduate, postgraduate studies in medicine, and is a very intelligent guy. And you listen to him speak, and you and you read his stuff. This is a guy that comes from smartness, right? And yep. and, and he says in the last two years. His life was just overtaken by Martians. And then he went and literally those are his words. And that's what he threw over the White House fence was uh, information that he needed to get to Obama. And part of it was a letter that he wrote to Obama saying, man, I know that they've got a hold of you, but you know what? You're doing a fine job. And it was this, <laughs> this letter. So you should go and read. It's Kyle, K-Y-L-E, Odom, O-D-O-M. Uh, yep. And so his pastor, the reptilian uh, pastor in Coeur d'Alene, yep. he shot. He shot him like 12 times, and the pastor lived, right? And so yep. he, he was arrested on first-degree attempted murder, and now he's back in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, awaiting trial. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty bizarre story. Hey, John, thank you so much. Are you going to be doing any speaking? Are you going to get out there and, and do anything? What are you doing right now? No, my health is so poor that uh, I can barely get up in the morning, and uh, I can't believe I've lasted two hours now because I limit all my interviews to one hour because it's just so tiring, but this has been uh, kind of fun. Yeah, I told you. I told you. And listen, <laughs> <laughs> check this out, John. We're going to be going uh, out to Area 51. We've got an RV. We're going to do this next month. And uh, we're going to head out. We're going to go do it and get as close as we can. I'm going to try to get arrested. I'm going to go try to talk to a camo dude. And uh, uh, I say that in jest, but if I can pull it off, you know, I think it'll be cool. Um, yeah. We've got to uh, maybe hook up for lunch and uh, as we go through town and, and you can tell us what to do and where to go. How's that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. I want you to be safe out there and keep fighting the good fight. Okay. You got it. John Lear, everybody. The real John Lear. Unbelievable conversation tonight. Thank you so much, John. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to head to a break, and uh, I'm going to open up the phone lines when I come back. 323-825-5045. What did you think about that conversation? That was the real John Lear. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. And uh, I've got a bunch of news i got to get through and some other stuff. We'll do all of that and take your phone calls right after this short break. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at jchurchradio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. This is the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. I'll be right back. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hey, I'll make you a deal. Give me 60 seconds and I'll give you directions to the Fountain of Youth. Okay, I'm joking. Well, we're well, kind of joking. No fountains, but youth, I got nature's youth and their premier anti-aging product nature's youth rsf with your sensible diet and exercise plan nature's youth rsf can help you look and feel better rsf is an all-natural amino acid supplement that supports your body to naturally increase hgh levels without any synthetic hormones and elevated hgh levels can contribute to increased energy improved libido reduced body fat and improved exercise capacity let's be honest who doesn't want to look and feel younger Visit the newly designed website at naturesyouth.com or call 800-333-6923. That's 800-333-6923 and like them on Facebook and you'll be included in contest and exclusive offers. What a deal. Oh, oh speaking of deals, my time's about up. 800-333-6923 or naturesyouth.com. Who needs a fountain anyway? Call today. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. 
The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full range boom boxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this, it's amazing. It's just 129 bucks and use the promo code JCRTWS and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple, just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tappy. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back to Fade to Black. What did you think about that? John Lear. (laughs) Man, oh man, oh man. I got to tell you, yeah, two hours, and I could have gone for another five. And uh, he was was in the mood tonight, and he was ready to go. So funny. Uh, Over the last couple of days talking to John. Man, I can't wait, Jimmy. I can't wait. And you know what? He was firing on all cylinders tonight. John friggin' Lear. Oh, man. All right. Phone lines are open. 323-825-5045. What did you think about that conversation? And uh, very interesting, very enlightening. Um, uh, That stuff about the MUFON Symposium back in Las Vegas with uh, uh, William Moore, when he was said, you know, he said he dropped the Cooper. That was Bill Cooper he was talking about. And, uh, man, John Lear. Just just the man at the center of the universe, always at the right place at the right time. And uh, I was uh, just looking at a couple of comments here on Twitter. Egyptian princess says, guess what I'm listening to again tomorrow morning with my coffee. What a great show. Brian says, hey, I may not believe everything Jimmy's guests say, but I always have a damn good time. You damn skippy, Brian. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, Eric just said, uh, I can't wait. Till Jimmy talks to John Lear after reading, after John reads the Kyle Odom story. I would love to hear what he has to say about Kyle. Yeah, you're you're right about that. And of course, Mark from Australia says, great interview with John Lear, Jimmy. Thank you so much. And you know what? Uh, Spiritual Warrior uh, says, uh, I miss those days. Good stuff. You're absolutely right. Those were crazy days indeed. Um, uh, I'll say this about this conversation tonight. Always remember that uh, I'm just a guy, right? I'm just here. You know, it's about the guest and, and what they have to say. I'm, I'm very blessed and very fortunate to be in this position to, to guide and, and try to ask the right questions at the right time. But when it's a guy like John, you just want to just sit back and absorb it. And I found myself doing that so many times tonight. I was just listening to him and zoning out and uh, getting sucked in just like all of you. Just an amazing conversation. All right, I'm going to open up the phone lines, 323-825-5045. Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. You're live. You're live. Three, two, one. You're live. Okay. Okay. I tried. There you go. 323-825-5045. Check this out. The U.S. Navy today sent a guided missile destroyer. Now, remember what we were talking about last night with Bruce Gagnon. Okay? That whole conversation on last night's show. And then, boom, this happens today. The Navy sent a guided, guided missile destroyer within 12 miles of that island in the South China Sea where China has uh, built an airstrip. And this is what we did. And I just don't get this. I really don't. It prompted China to scramble fighter jets, dispatch warships, 
to, you know, quote unquote, expel the American ship. It was the USS William P. Lawrence. And we are saying we exercise the right of innocent passage while transiting inside 12 nautical miles of fiery cross reef. Now, it's a guided missile destroyer. <laughs> There's nothing innocent about transiting inside of 12 nautical miles with a guided missile cruiser. All right. You are just trying to provoke something. And then we came back and said, under the United Nations Convention, the law of the sea, 12 nautical miles is considered the limit at which a nation's rule extends off its shores. The law of sea defines innocent passage as a transit in which a ship does not conduct any military, commercial, or research activities. It's a guided missile cruiser. The Pentagon statement said that the U.S. did not notify any of the countries involved about the destroyer's transit in advance. We're lucky that thing didn't get fired upon. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Okay, there you go. Let's go to the next caller. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Yeah, hi. Hi, you're live right now. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, I uh, just got off work. I missed the interview with John. I, I listened to his interview last night from the 90s with Art Bell, and it blew my mind. So I, I can't wait to uh, listen to uh, your guys' interview. But I was just curious. Did you guys uh, talk to him at, at all about the uh, Tom DeLong Secret Machines project? Uh, we've got uh, – there is – I'm going to say this about that uh, really quick. We may be doing something of, uh, on that on a show in the next week or two. Okay. Oh man, that is great to hear. Cause I've just been, I've just been, I mean, I've just been, you know, captivated by by that ever since I, I heard that interview with uh, George Knapp a yeah. couple months ago. So yeah, absolutely. And like I said, uh, we're working on that right now. All right. Okay. Uh, just stay, hey, st thanks for letting me on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Hey, how you doing, brother? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm I'm John from Los Angeles. Um, I was just wondering about um, the uh, when he said they, they they had the um the the um what is it uh, the 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 um the kingdoms of upstairs that looks like a holograph because I was I was I I I when I, after nine eleven I was um. I, I saw them with my physical eyes um, flying over New York City. Interesting. What is it that you saw? Well, uh, according to what he was saying, was um, you know, it was a it was a hologram. But you know, I saw them with my own eyes type of mode. You know, right? I, I I went I went to. I was going back home to pick up my brother um, on the plane flight, and I saw like black smoke coming from the, you know, New York Trade Center's type of mode. You know, I was, I was like, oh my, yeah, yeah, it looked, wow. It looked like it was. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. What's your name? Uh, John. Hey, John. Thank you for the phone call, and I find that really, really interesting. And also, along the same time, uh, let's not forget about this. There was all of the, and I remember uh, not only reading about this, but hearing about this directly, about some of the stuff that was uh, the holograms that were allegedly projected in the skies over Iraq. And not only did we do it in the first Gulf War, but we did it in the second Gulf War. You know, and if you are going to develop a technology like that, we're talking about cheap. Okay? It doesn't cost you anything to project. It's the cost of electricity. Yeah, you have the cost of whatever it, it's going to take to develop the gear. But after that, you're just flipping a switch, right? It's just electricity. So how easy is it to do? Now, I have said many times on the show, I am not discounting uh, anybody's opinions on 9-11. All theories are on the table because something funny went down there. I The hologram theory behind it, which we've all heard many, many, many times, I'm, I'm not as comfortable in 
and now I'm saying it's anything is possible, but I'm not going there. But what I do have issues with, because I've, I've tried to fly these planes on uh, different simulation programs, and I can't pull it off. I can't. Now, Gran Turismo, racing a car on the ground, I got that down, right? <laughs> got all the gear to, to do all those driving games. But when it comes to flying on simulators and trying to learn how to fly those aircraft, I couldn't pull it off. Couldn't do it. I could get a Cessna off the ground and kind of buzz around, could never land it, right? But when it comes to the big aircraft, I just couldn't, I couldn't master it. So I don't understand, and that's where I'm with John on this. I can't imagine somebody, no matter how long they've been training, is going to go and get in one of these real aircraft and first pass through, hit it dead nuts uh, right into the center of the building. I, man. I have issues with that unless these guys that took over were actual professional trained pilots. Now, that's a whole nother thing. So I, I don't know. I really don't know. What I do know is there is a big conspiracy behind 9-11 and uh, we're no closer to the truth today than we ever were. And I don't know if we ever will find out the truth. One thing is for sure about 9-11. I'm dead nuts positive on this. Washington and Saudi Arabia, and probably others, knew in advance that that was going to happen. And that is the big conspiracy, because nobody can tell the future. We knew, Washington knew, they knew that it was going to happen. And if you know that, then there's a whole mess. Think about that. All right, 323-825. Five zero four five. Carlin Q. Williams, a 39 year old inmate in federal prison today, says he is the son of music legend and sole heir of Prince. And he's the sole heir to his estate. His claims were filed by his attorney in the same court that Prince's siblings are seeking their share of Prince's estate. Williams says, now listen to this. Williams says that his mother in July 1976 had sex with Prince. And then, uh, uh, back then, he was just an unknown guy at a hotel in Kansas City. Williams' mother Marsha Henson says in an affidavit that she and the singer drank wine at a hotel lobby and then got a room at another hotel. Yes. She said she knows Williams is Prince's child because she didn't have sex with anyone six weeks before her alleged encounter with Prince and uh, until didn't have sex again until after her son was born. Prince would have been 17 or 18 years old at the time. The filing says that Henson gave birth to Prince's son on April 8, 1977. Now, in the court filings, he is asking, Williams is asking that Prince's DNA be tested. And they will prove that Williams is Prince's child. How crazy is this? And now, at the same time, all this is going on. The siblings now, and we expected this, that, that stuff is out of control, right? And, and this battle is going to go on for a while now. They've got somebody appointed to deal with this, but it, this isn't going to get settled anytime soon. They said that there is a, a safe somewhere in, in Prince's uh, estate, whether that's been opened or not, or even located, that's only being talked about, right? That's the, the first thing. Second thing is they're insisting that he doesn't have a will. But then why are you wanting to get inside this safe? Doesn't make sense, does it? Maybe there is a will in that safe. Maybe there is some intention of a will or a mention of what he wanted to do with his estate. I can't imagine that somebody 57 years old that's worth three hundred million dollars that with all of your financial advisors 
that you have in play with a $300 million estate. Don't forget, when you have that kind of money floating around, you don't have $300 million in, a, in a, an account. You don't. You've got that stuff split up in hundreds of banks. <laughs> that money is all over the place. And you have somebody managing that for you. You don't do it. You don't have 100 checkbooks in your office. Well, maybe you do, but you have somebody managing that money for you and telling you what to do. And at the age of 57, with that kind of estate, that there was nobody in place uh, for not only estate planning, but, but trust funds or something just in case something happened. Not necessarily a will, but somebody is advising you just in case, right? I'm telling you, that conversation happened hundreds of times. So we're not going to see the end of this anytime soon unless they crack that safe or a will is produced or there's some intent of trust funds. I don't understand why a lawyer, one of Prince's attorneys, hasn't stepped forward and said, okay, I've, I've represented Prince for years. This is what we discussed. Right? That hasn't happened. And that, to me, is bizarre. Now, Williams, this... Uh, alleged son of Prince, and he would be the sole heir. That's the that's the crazy part. Right now, he's serving 92 months in a Colorado federal prison for possession of a firearm by a felon. But uh, you never know what this DNA is going to prove. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, you know what what that's going to prove. But when he gets out of prison, if it happens. Think about that. That the, the dance would happen, right? He would be everybody's best friend in prison, no doubt. Kat just said, she said, why would he not have a will? Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. We have to remember, we're talking about a $300 million estate. $30 million to $3 million estate. You've got financial advisors that are guiding you and telling you what to do, and especially just in case. That conversation happened all the time. It's funny. It's really, really funny. Man, I'm loving everybody's comments here in uh, Twitter. You know, and, and let's just say, uh, may the man rest in peace. Haven't I said this from the beginning? Man, his body is still warm. Unbelievable. All right, well, here we go. And if you haven't seen these pictures of this, if you go to our Facebook page, you can check this out. After years of research and a huge amount of speculation, scientists have now been upstaged by a 15-year-old Canadian schoolboy, and his name is William Gadori, whose startling realization about ancient Mayan wisdom has enabled him to discover the location of a lost city deep in the jungles of southern Mexico. Now check this out. Speaking to the journal de Montreal in French, the aspiring young scientist said he did not understand why the Maya built their cities away from rivers, on marginal lands, and in the mountains. It didn't make sense to him. Yet... He was convinced that they had to have another reason. And as they worshipped the stars, the idea came to me, he says, to verify my hypothesis. I was really surprised and excited when I realized that the most brilliant stars of the constellations matched the largest Maya cities. After his amazing Eureka moment, Gadori then turned his attention to yet another constellation, consisting of just three stars. Since two of these lined up perfectly with two known Mayan ruins, he began to speculate that the third must also reveal the location of an as yet unknown ancient settlement. So, dude is 15 years old. Using satellite imagery from the Canadian Space Agency and mapping this onto Google Earth, he was able to spot, and I've seen the picture, what appears to be a large pyramid. Yeah, similar to those found at most other Mayan cities, surrounded by a series of other structures. You've got to go and check this out. Go to our Facebook page right now, Jimmy Church Radio, and check it out. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Hey, Jimmy, what's up? Who's this? It's Beth. 
Hey, Bev, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing great, but I think you're calling to say what an amazing conversation that was with John Lear. Yes, yes. And? And, and hey. also, I have to tend to agree with you about Prince. And what's that? That you can't tell me he was worth that much money and he did not have a will. Right. Or, or some intention to distribute trust funds to his kids. You know, that's yeah. what that's what financial planners do, right? Yeah. It's like. Yep. When I first heard that, I told Bob, I said, what? You can't, you can't tell me he didn't have a will. No, you can't. You just can't. You know, I, I, I'm just not buying into this. You know, it, it, what it says to me, you know, look, I don't know anything. I don't have any inside information. But you know what? I know what brothers and sisters and siblings and all that do when money starts coming around. You know, it's yeah. like somebody got a copy of the will and burned it because they weren't in it. <laughs> I just say, mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I would yeah. do. That's what I would do. I would take that thing and, and, and burn it, not shred it, not throw it away, burn it. You know, so I don't know. I'm not saying that that's what went down, but it just seems really strange that a guy worth $300 million at the age of 57 did mm-hmm. not consider the distribution of funds either through a trust or a different trust or a will uh, and, and, and ha- didn't have many versions of that. Exactly. And can you imagine if, and you know, if he didn't, how many people are going to be coming out of the woodwork? <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to continue to. Yeah, like this uh, oh. like this prisoner in Colorado. And and you know what? He, he just made, I mean, I don't know, man. Uh, they filed these uh, papers and the story sounds legit. And just what if? You know, all of those siblings, if there's a sole heir and he's a prisoner in, in Colorado, that, uh, you know, uh, how their tune is going to change really quick. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to all make friends with their new buddy in Colorado. Hey, Bev, thanks for the phone call and be safe out there. Give my best to Bob. Okay, I will. Thank you so much. <laughs> Love you guys. Love you back. Bob just tweeted, Jimmy J- Jimmy just caught Beverly speechless. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Hey, did you guys, did, have you guys seen the videos of Axel fronting ACDC in Lisbon? Has anybody seen these videos yet? I'm going to watch Twitter fire up here after we get past the uh, tape delay. But have you seen the videos? Now, I went through, um, somebody sent me a cell phone video yesterday. So I watched that, and that was of, uh, I think that was Back in Black, right? And I'm watching the video. I'm like, wait a minute, man. I don't see Axel here. And I kept trying to look. And the cell phone video is, you know, following uh, 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 um, uh, the band around, right? It was just a full motion video. And uh, so anyway, I'm, uh, I was going to say Malcolm Angus, following Angus around the stage. And, uh, but... Axel sounded pretty good, and I knew it was going to be like that. I mean, it sounded pretty good. It sounded pretty good, and and I think they made the right choice. So anyway, have you seen the new videos, the professional stuff that has been circulating? Kat says she hasn't seen them. Okay, there's um uh there's uh, I, I've seen three, and uh, I've seen four if you count Back in Black, but this is it. Are you ready? Are you ready, Cat? Are you ready, World, if you haven't seen the videos yet? Axel has got a leg brace on, and he's sitting in a chair. Yeah, he's sitting in this throne. It's this padded leather chair. That uh, um, Okay, yeah, that's, that's that one, uh, Mark. But you need to. I know, everybody's freaking out. Um, uh, so... He's sitting in this chair, and it's up. It, it, it's a stand that they've rolled out on stage. It's kind of like a wheelchair. Again, there's wheels on it. But um, it's got all of this metal metal fabrication work around the bottom of it. It looks pretty cool. On the front of the chair is a set of horns, devil horns, that he's got, like, towels wrapped over. 
Um, he's got this leg brace on, and the leg brace is supported up by this uh, uh, thing that's holding his leg in place. And it almost looked to me as Axel is singing, and he's trying to get into it and everything. And he is. He's doing great. It sounds great. It sounds amazing. I'm not going to say that it's not. It sounds great. But um, it looked to me like his leg was strapped in that chair. In other words, if he wanted to get up and stand, it wasn't going to happen. Okay? He stayed in the chair. <laughs> it was pretty bizarre to watch because, you know, Axel and his moves and, and things. He was denied all of that. But the pipes and the way that it was done and the way that it sounded and the look and the stage and Lisbon and everything was uh, was pretty amazing. And Axel, uh, uh, this isn't a gimmick. It's not a gimmick. It's not what everybody was thinking. This is going to be just some a load of crap. I'm not saying that at all, man. I'm telling you right now, Axel sounds great. Oh, who posted this? Yes, there you go. All right, <laughs> there it is. And uh, let me retweet this really quick so everybody can see what I'm talking about. So in this picture, there it is. I just tweeted it out. There's the, see the devil horn, see the sand, see the towel on it. Okay, see the metal structure down there at the bottom. That's probably a foot thick. This is right on the stage. You can see his foot in the brace. He's got his pant leg cut off, and that brace goes all the way up to his knee. And it looks to me, this is what it looked like to me, like his leg was strapped to that chair. Might not have been, but what I didn't see was his left leg move. It never, not, not a millimeter. That baby is clamped down tight. But. Axel sounded great. Shaved, clean shaven, as you can see. He's got his cowboy hat on, and he sounded great. Sounded absolutely fantastic. You should go out there and check it out. All right, let's see. Where am I at? Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe is going to be here. And uh, what we're going to talk about uh, tomorrow night with Linda, she's got new research uh, that she's got on the Sphinx. We're going to talk about that. There's uh, four or five other projects that she's working on. We're going to talk about that as well. And we're going to talk about a presentation that she's going to be doing on out at Contact in the Desert. Then, after Linda, tomorrow night, Victoria and Paul are going to join us from Contact in the Desert. And we're going to talk about all of the special events that they're going to be doing out there at Contact. Some of the changes that they've made. They've made some enormous investments into the facility and the compound out there that is the Joshua Tree Retreat Center and all of those exciting changes that are going on out there. All right, so that's our show tomorrow night. It's going to be great. And then, of course, Thursday is Fader Night. Open lines all night long with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom. I want to thank John Lear. Going the distance tonight, an absolutely brilliant show. Thank you so much. Faded Blacks executive producers Rita Camaria on shows produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark T. Kovar, LJ3, Renee, Mark Dunbar, Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Uh, announces are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoe, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication, KGRA, the planet. Thank you to everyone that called in tonight. Very special thanks to the real John Lear. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2016 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe. Everybody be safe. Go back, Lee Teppy.